Are you ready? Stand by. Hey everybody, I'm Dave Hartman and welcome to another exciting episode of The Three Gun Show, the world's largest three gun podcast. This is episode 238 with special field correspondent Brian Vaught, who does a match recon of the 2018 version of a match that's going down in just a few days after the launch of this episode, the Rock Hard Three Gun. This is a replay for Patreon subscribers and if you like this type of content, you can hear all match recon podcasts real time by supporting the show at patreon.com slash three gun show. That's P A T R E O N. And uh, speaking of Patreon, I just made a post the other day about another benefit for Patreon subscribers. And this is a special offer from IWI. They are recreating a limited number of Galil Ace rifles built up just like I built mine up for Red October. And uh, they're only available to Patreon subscribers. So if you're a current patron and you haven't seen that post yet, make sure you go check it out. In the meantime, I'm heading to Vortex Optics to do some podcasting and to teach a three-gun class. So while I do that, you get to enjoy this Match Recon episode with Brian Vaught. Brian, welcome back to the podcast. Hey, Dave. Thanks for having me back, man. Man, I'm I'm uh, pumped to have you back, Vaught. You know, I looked at uh, Skype before we got on here, and it looks like December 2015 is the last time that you used uh, some technology that wasn't like a citizens band radio. Yes. I, um, I don't, I'm not a a regular Skyper. (laughs) I I don't, um, I don't do that. Um, and of course we had a delay for some reason or another. Uh, I think it was your computer. Yeah. It was hey, not mine. Mine was working. Yeah. It's my son's. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. You know, what's crazy is like, I use this, this, uh, computer all day, every day for the podcast. I record, Tons of podcasts with it using uh, Skype and stuff like that. And then uh, the one one time when I'm like, oh, you know what? I'll just cut it close and get to the office like 15 minutes before the podcast. Then, of course, needs a restart, has an update. There's a delay. Well, you need a 16-year-old to run your computer <laughs> IT stuff because, I mean, my son will have his phone plugged in. He'll be messaging with somebody. He'll be online. He'll have the TV on and he'll be listening to music all at the same time. No kidding. And, and I'm, I mean, I don't think he was hugged enough or something <laughs> since sensory deprived or something. I'm not sure what it is, but it's anyway. probably what it is. He can't feel. That's what it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, um, man, welcome back to the, uh, to the show here over Skype. You've, you've been on a couple times since then though, in, uh, in person, and it's uh it's much much easier in person than it is over the, over the Skype. A lot of, lot less barriers to entry. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And I think we I don't remember when the last time we did it in person was, but usually we've had some something to drink. Yeah. Too, so things kind of roll out. Maybe maybe a little less organized. I'm not sure. <laughs> Well, Brian, we what's... talked about doing a drunk history version of that. <laughs> yeah, we ought to do that. So you're a, you're a Kentucky guy, so I'm imagining uh, bourbon, or what have you been drinking lately? Um, I've been drinking uh, uh, tequila lately, uh, but I do drink bourbon, I have to say, and I do drink Kentucky bourbon. I don't drink any Tennessee whiskey or anything like that. And I live right in the middle of Kentucky, so like on a, on a fall day, you can smell the mash um, from my back porch. No kidding. Oh yeah, they make. I mean, fifteen miles from here, they're making, making bourbon in million gallon mash barrels. So, if the wind's right and it's a cool evening, you can smell it. It's pretty cool. Catch a buzz? No, that unfortunately you cannot catch a buzz <laughs> from it. Um, but I mean, I grew up here drinking like um, White Label Jim Beam and, <laughs> and Wild Turkey. Wow! People, what's your favorite bourbon? Because everybody has these. You know, they think bourbon's like champagne or something like that. But I really, I'm a, I like Wild Turkey 101. It's not my favorite. Oh, man. Bourbon. It's like 25 bucks a fifth, but I still like it. I um, had, so my, my uncles uh, drank Wild Turkey um, growing up, like my dad's uh, brothers and, and brothers in law. And uh, man, they used to play like endless poker games around like Christmas and Thanksgiving. And it turns around, turns out like all these years later, they were passing around a bottle of Wild Turkey around under the table. And that's why they spent so much time playing cards. But uh, uh, as I got older, I'm like, well, you know, this is what the uh, the Hartman boys uh, drank, so I'm going to go get myself a bottle of 
Wild Turkey 101. And, uh, man, you only yeah. do that a couple times when you're in college yeah, and you it, don't know I your ju- limits. <laughs> well, it's cost-effective, though, because you're yeah. getting 20% more alcohol. <laughs> and um, so you can share it and that kind of stuff. And, and it's not expensive and really, you know, um, I'm not I'm not – a bourbon snob about you know folks talk about different types of stuff and i have drank some really good bourbon and there is stuff if you go to the rock if you go to the rock for pro-am and walk around the parking lot you know there'll be guys handing around 75 dollar bottles of bourbon just handing them like they're you know passing around a jar of moonshine or something like that Mm -hmm. but you know that's kind of a trendy thing but i still like just regular uh, it doesn't matter after the second or third drink what difference does it make yeah, exactly. I can't uh, feel my face anyway. <laughs> That's why you always got to start off with the uh, the good bourbon and then just move into the crap after that. There you go. There you go. <laughs> oh, well, hey, so speaking of The Rock, uh, a Rock Castle Shooting Center, you you shot a match recently, and that's what we're we're here to talk about. So what would you shoot, Brian? Well, the, the latest, greatest match down at uh, Rock Castle, and they have got a bunch of stuff going on this year. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm going back there next I'm going there Sunday to run a 10K uh, two-gun match. That's kind of become a flavor around here. Yeah. But the last big match there was the Rock Hard uh, three-gun match that Bruce Davidson puts on for uh, to benefit Mission 22. Uh-huh. And uh, it was uh, the third and fourth of this month. March. March of uh, Rock at Rock Castle Shooting Center. Um, just to give you kind of the stats on it, it was a, a, a points based match. So it was six stages, uh, percentage based points, uh, rule set was kind of, um, hybrid <laughs> made up for this match. I mean, I would say it was kind of a kind of pro-am rules with some, uh, some, uh, specific rules for different stages. And, and I can go into more of that later, but Bruce adds some high value targets and some things so that, so that you don't move with, um, uh, you don't reholster a hot gun. Mm -hmm. You know, he puts that kind of into the stage, uh, and makes the rules around that. So, and we'll get into this in a minute here when we uh, start talking about the match itself, but it's very unique match. And one of the unique, it's unique from the onset too. Like I, I actually read through the rules and uh, Bruce adds some some humor and some flavor into those rules that actually keep you engaged in reading them. And they're not, it's not dry like reading the USPSA rule book. Well, you know, if you read Ken Nelson's rules from Hard as Hell, and Bruce Bruce has shot Hard as Hell, I want to say the last two years, because Brian and I went out there. Brian Ray is my brother-in-law and my teammate on Team Sampson Double Star. We went to Hard as Hell three years ago and came back to Kentucky, and we're like. That was awesome. And so uh, I think Bruce went year before last as well and was squatted with him. And if you read Ken Nelson's rules, they're hilarious yeah. to that match. And uh, so Bruce kind of put it out there kind of similarly uh, and kind of kind of tongue-in-cheek. You know, some of the rules are, this is supposed to be hard, so suck it up. Right. Uh, and uh, th- these are the rules, and, and they may change, and they may be specific to a a stage after we build it to make it to make you shoot it like we want you to or uh you know to cut down the gaming or sometimes just to to make the the stage flow in the right direction for safety reasons or for whatever Mm -hmm. so well and i fun fun fact i don't know if i ever told you guys this but um after talking to you and brian ray about uh hard as hell i actually went and shot it and you guys are the reason that i went and shot it i mean it's a you know, Western match, but, uh, I was traveling around at the time. And so I actually went out to, uh, uh, SUPS in, uh, Southern Utah, St. George and shot the 2016 match because of you mm-hmm. dudes. Yeah. We have barbecued it together. Hell Remember? yeah, we did. That was good. I went back to that place last year. It was awesome. Was it? Yeah. I mean, you can't get barbecue that good around here. I don't think. What, what was it? JJ's barbecue or something like that. It was in yeah. Washington. Yeah. But anyway, yeah, it, it, the 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 hardest hell match is where this type of this this type of match in Blue Ridge, and I think the biggest difference is Blue Ridge is is uh, of course a well established match. I think uh, this year will be my tenth Blue Ridge this Damn. coming, and um, it's always been hard. 
and it's at three minute timeouts and it is really kind of a set rule set. It hadn't changed a whole lot. I, I can think we were trying to think of the rule sets that have changed in Blue Ridge in 10 years. And, um, we could remember the addition of a red dot to, <laughs> to limited, which I don't remember when that happened. And I fought that tooth and nail, man. I hated that idea. And now all I shoot is a red dot, but you know, <laughs> I was, I was such a, I was such a, a dick online about everybody that wanted to shoot a red dot. I was like, you're running limited, blah, blah, blah. And, and uh, of course there were only like six people that would shoot limited then because you had to shoot iron. So right. the red dot was supposed to expand it and it did do that. And, <sighs> And I guess, I guess, you know, whatever they were right and I was wrong. Okay. <laughs> but, um, I still think that it, it'd be kind of cool to shoot irons from time to time. And I do at some local matches. You know, they but, actually uh, had an irons division at the, uh, Wyoming Magpul governor's match that I shot last year. And it was a, a true irons. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. I there mean, was I very, very few people in it do. though. Yeah. How many people shot in that division? Do you, uh, know? you know, I'll, I'll four, I, I could, I could tell you, but it wasn't on practice score. It's. I don't know where the hell the scores are, uh, <laughs> but I would say less less than uh, less than eight for sure. Well, you know, I, I when I first started shooting three gun, that's the reason I shot irons is because that's all I had on my gun. And uh, I mean, I had the carry handle AR. You know what I'm talking about? Oh, so, nice. You know, I'm not talking about detachable. <laughs> I mean, <it> was, <laughs> oh, really? Like it was the rece- part of the receiver? Yeah, the first Blue Ridge I shot was with a with a uh, A1 upper. Nice. With a D milled one and twelve A one upper and a GI lower. It just I still have it. It shoots pretty good as long as you don't shoot heavy bullets. But um yeah, so I shot limited for the first couple of years and then and, and so Blue Ridge's Blue Ridge's rule set would only allow for that, as most matches would only allow for that. A mm-hmm. dot was not an option. And then uh they changed that and then I wanna say Andy changed um where they would allow the uh, uh, grip safety to be uh, considered a active safety. Oh, so I gotcha. So when you jump to 1911, even if your thumb safety wasn't on, if your grip safety had not been disengaged, then it counted as a safety. And uh, I think that's it. I think those are maybe the only two, and maybe I'm wrong. There could be something that I'm overlooking, but I don't think that anything has changed related to Blue Ridge rules. And they've been, and Blue Ridge is also, you're kind of on your own from the start to the end. It, you know, no matter how long it takes you or no matter how much you've messed up or no matter what happens with your gear, you're solo. And with matches like Hard as Hell and matches like Bruce's match, and the flavor kind of came from Hard as Hell, it is a coaching match. You can coach. Yeah. And you can, it's interesting. And to some degree, even help, which is something that a lot of people, you know, there's some controversy about whether that's really you know, a competition at that point. Yeah. And, and I saw, uh, some videos of, uh, of helping and we'll get down, uh, get to that in the, uh, uh, the match flavor here, I think. Um, so yeah, so it was, it was on practice score. Yes, it was. The schedule, um, unique schedule on this match because there's a lot to try to cram into, uh, two days. Oh yeah. And, and in February, well, in March, in the beginning of March in Kentucky, not a lot know, of sunshine. Yeah, so we were uh, we were hoofing it, and and there was a division, the ROs, and a couple of other. Well, I don't know how many exactly, but maybe a dozen or so other competitors shot all of the stages in one day on Friday, the day before. And mm-hmm. they ended up this. It was called the hard ass match, <laughs> and you got a special patch for that. Like Bruce has these patches made up, and that's basically your participation trophy. I like it. And he says, you know, everybody bitches and moans about participation trophies, but people can't, you know, line up fast enough to get their rock hard patch at the end of the match because they all feel they all feel like they've accomplished something because you kind of have. Yeah, uh, that's exact same way as a Spartan race is, you know, everybody gets a medal at the finish at the end. You know, the top three guys get, uh, you know, some sort of trophy and I think uh, some cash or something, but. There's several thousand other people that do it just for the medal, and they're proud of it, super proud of it. Right. I mean, maybe the best thing that I won last year, year before last, was a tab at Hard as Hell. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. I just like it's cool, and I'm never going to sell it. I'm not going to put it on, you know, 
Enos or, or some uh, garage sale Facebook thing. I mean, that's something I'm going to keep forever. And I just think that those kind of things are kind of neat. I mean, now that was actually something I, I won. I, and it wasn't just for participation, but still those patches and those type of things. I don't know. They're just kind of neat. I uh, like them. They're very so, unique, you know. And they cost a, they cost a match director like three bucks a right. piece, you know. So, um, so anyway, um, I don't even remember what we were talking about. So now. We're, we're talking about the schedule. So the the oh. RO shot the first uh, the first day, which was Friday of the match, and uh, understand they had to finish in the uh, under headlights uh, on a couple stages. Oh yeah, they wore headlamps, and <laughs> some of them had weapons lights on. Now this is in a field. So this is in Thunder Valley around cars and shit. So, um, yeah, they, they, they did the, I guess, remember the, what was the Mark Wahlberg movie, the, uh, the undefeated movie or whatever, where he's the Eagles football player, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. They, I, I can't all with the headlamps on or what? Yeah. 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 I mean, there's, there's stuff on Facebook and there's some videos of these guys out jumping around and running around on tops of cars with headlamps <laughs> on the stage. And uh, I think they did a, a couple of the, the hard-ass squads finished that way. One was down in Cowboy Town, and one was in Thunder Valley on those cars. And uh, let me tell you what, that was extremely challenging in the middle of the day. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> well, and so for the for the main, they got um, the shaft a little bit, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so for the main match, it was uh, it was a full day match each day, right? Yeah, every bit of a full. Well. We didn't shoot until we, believe it or not, you know, shooting three stages a day um, and the way that he has the stages laid out, uh, there's not a lot of reset and there's hardly any reset past about the the first third of the shooter's movement. So uh, we got done in time for people to shoot side matches on Saturday. Nice. And they shot side matches for, I don't know couple hours we had a couple hours of daylight to shoot side matches so that's part of the reason for the matches so people can shoot these side matches because it helps generate some revenue for the uh, charity yeah so what bruce does and he gives a very interesting shooters um brief at the beginning is you know if you guys don't freaking get done then you don't get to come shoot these side matches that i got set up for you so you know move your asses that type of pep talk <laughs> It's not really a pep talk. It's more of a cracking the whip on you. But people do want to do that. And, and shooting three stages with the, the experienced shooters that come to this and the people that come to this and the reason they come to it is uh, not to loaf. <laughs> yeah. Well, and so you had, um, let's see, it was a $200 match fee, uh, 137 shooters. 137 shooters actually shot some of the match. I think they had four DQs, if I remember right. Okay. But yeah, 100, so 133 people finished it. Gotcha. Or shot most of it or whatever. So. All right. So <laughs> let's uh, let's cover divisions and winners here, and then uh, and let's talk about those side matches. Okay. All right. Uh, division, TAC Optics. <clears throat> we really had some talent that came out to this thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, the first year... <laughs> It was, it was, there was so, some talented shooters there. We have some really good shooters in this area, but so, uh, Timmy Ackley is first, uh, Jacob, uh, Tukasik was second mm -hmm. and, uh, Matt, uh, Kupika was third. So we had a Michigan contingent, an Indiana fairly local boy and, uh, Tim from who's now living out in Utah. Yeah. And Brian, Brian made the trip with him from Utah. So we had some, we had some pretty good talent there. And then in Tack Irons, this the winner was uh, Jacob Blout, who won last year. Uh, I was second. Joel Fox was third. Congratulations! And, uh, thank you. Jacob beat me last year as well, but I think he's like he might be sixteen or seventeen years old. I'm not really sure how old he is. Or huh. He might be in the twenties. He just looks that young to me. <laughs> but um, he he runs like a deer. You know, I just. I watch videos of him. He's running around. There's no way I can move that fast. I could not move that fast if I was falling from a building. <laughs> so anyway, so anyway, um, in open, uh, Brian Butcher won. Mark Roth was second. And uh, Stockton was third. 
So, and then our division winners, uh, Sky Killian Kane from up from Texas, and of course her home range, and she's going to be the match director of the of the Hard as Hell Texas match. Sweet. Uh, Jacob Blout was High Mill. Um, Hi Ali was uh, Farwell, and I'm I'm sorry I don't know everybody's first name. That's um, uh that's Joe Farwell from uh, yeah, Florida. That's, yes, that's Joe Farwell, right? And uh, uh, Mark uh, Lackley was the top junior, and uh, senior was Mr. Weller. And again, I can't. I'm really bad with first names. So I think that's Tom Lackley, right? Is junior? I think. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. So, and I think he finished pretty high too. Yeah. So. But yeah, he's uh, coming on hot. Yeah, I think he might have even had some. Well, I think I'm not sure how. I think Tim won almost every stage, <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, uh, he might have been second in one stage. Maybe he fell down or his gun stopped working or something. I don't know. But uh, it's yeah, of, he's something to watch. It's kind of a fun yeah. thing, uh, Brian, doing these uh, match recons. Because it it uh, forces me to look at the um, the winners, and then we've kind of been doing. We started out doing just like you know who won first place, but I don't think that tells the whole story. And so we uh, we dug into like third place on this, and you're seeing a lot of the same names and and in, uh, in matches like all across the country. It's pretty interesting. Well, and you know, you you look at the the folks that are willing to travel. Mm-hmm. So match like this, and like there's like no, Bruce does a weird thing. I hate to talk about prize tables, but you know whatever they're going away. Okay, I, I don't know anybody told you that, but yeah. they're they're far less than what they have been. Mm-hmm. So a lot of shooters, and I mean some really serious ones, are looking for what they want in a match is 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 you know good stages and that type of thing and. This this match certainly had it, and it really drew from. I mean, we had people from all over the freaking place, and um, it's because of some of the exposure that it got from last year, and just you know watching the videos and stuff like that from last year. People were like, "Holy crap!" So, you know, um, I can't remember who did the numbers on it, but but Tim shooting ten stages at hard as hell last year shot for like seventeen minutes total. Yeah. So Tim shooting at rock hard this year in six stages shot for 17 plus minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the winner of the match. And that's the winner. Right. I mean, I shot for almost 20 minutes, I think, and it felt like it, but, uh, <laughs> you know, that's a, you're, this is five minute timeouts and the best shooters are shooting them. I mean, really, really talented shooters are shooting these stages in three minutes right? or three to four. That's kind of what, they that's kind of what um bruce wanted and brian and i designed help design and set up we went down there the weekend before and set up one of the stages and i mean we went through it several times with a with a stopwatch kind of figuring out where right about three minutes was like hitting everything the first shot and knowing that nobody would probably do that right And last year we designed a stage for the first one that was called the B and B stage. And some people have seen it on, on the internet, but (laughs) we, we got some, um, we got some, it started that you were laying in a bed and we got some Samson sheets made and (laughs) pillowcases. So you laid in this bed in supine position with your rifle was staged actually under the bed. And so you got up and, you know, shot, shot the stage from part of it from the bed. And so like hardly anybody finished that freaking stage. I mean, it Mm -hmm. was five minutes and I maybe 12 people finished it out of a hundred or something. That's crazy. So this year we had to outdo ourselves. So we did something similar where you ran through a thicket shooting. I think you shot 16 targets that were like eight inch plates at 50 and 60 yards off hand. (laughs) Nice. (laughs) So, this one was called the Plan B stage. That's, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Bruce kind of gave us a little instruction about kind of how he wanted it, and uh, I've never set up a stage. Uh, usually, it's been for matches that Brian and I put on, but I've never set up a stage and been a little nervous when Bruce showed up about like, is he going to change this around? Because he's real particular. He has a vision, man. Yeah, he wants it followed. And, uh, uh, we were pretty close. 
he didn't really he didn't really he didn't really give us too much trouble over how we had it set up but um doing stuff at rock castle there's just there's just no end to how creative you can be because they'll let you do anything you want to yeah it's a pretty incredible opportunity well um speaking of other opportunities so let's let's talk about those side matches uh um brian there's a pistol shotgun pcc rifle and and a trap side ma- side match right Right. So one thing was Friday evening, you can you can show up the night before if you want to while it's still light, and they have wobble trap there that David Power is running. Mm-hmm. And Powers is doing like fifty percent payback to the charity on the wobble trap. So some people did that for out. I mean, some people showed up probably around lunchtime and were like looking at stages, and after they looked at stages, they go shoot wobble trap. Mm-hmm. And you could do it as many times as you wanted to. I think it was five dollars a round or something like that. And, um, and 50% goes back to mission 22, which is the charity that this match supports. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's a payout to the winners and I can't remember how, I think everything went back because I think Gamal supplied all of the, the, the clays and so forth. Oh, nice. So the, um, the other side match that goes on, and let let me say, say something about the side matches. Uh, the side matches, there's a pistol, a rifle, a shotgun and a PCC side match. The pistol, rifle, and shotgun are in the bays. Mm-hmm. Or I'm sorry, pistol, PCC, and the shotgun are in the bays. Um, that you do all of those Saturday evening after you shot your first three stages, and people did that for like two hours in the evening because we finished early enough to for people to go up there. And you can do them as many times as you want. And the the winner um, like wins the PCC. And, oh, nice. Yeah. So the way that the way that you buy into these is you donate to Mission Twenty Two, and um, there's no set buy-in to these side matches. You just have to donate. And and Bruce says at the beginning of all this, he said, you know, whatever you feel is appropriate is what you need to donate, <laughs> and. You can you can shoot our side matches for nothing. You don't have to pay a dime to shoot our side matches, but none of your buddies that are standing around are going to let you get away with that. <laughs> and so it's kind of being shamed. And so most people give 10, 20 bucks or whatever. And it really is kind of weird how it starts to take shape because, you know, folks are shooting the pistol side match and and somebody shoots it really well, but maybe not as well as they could have. And somebody will walk up and donate. 10 bucks for that person to shoot it again, you know, not even for them to shoot it again. So those side matches, as well as the match fees and some t-shirt sales there and so forth are what raises the money for the charity, which is mission 22, which raises, um, awareness to veteran suicide. Right. And is one of the, one of the major charities that rock castle is involved in and is kind of their, it's kind of what a lot of their matches benefit there. So, I got you. So there's a, so the, the pistol side match describe the, uh, you know, well, what, the pistol, what you had to do there. The pistol side match, you had, uh, I don't know, you shot X number of plates from different ports and whoever could move to those ports and shoot all those plates in the least, you know, as fast It's like a stage. Okay. Okay. And so, but it was real quick, you know, it was quick and, and down and dirty, no reset, that type of thing. The PCC side match, I think was, um, five plates in a bay, uh, from two positions. So you shot the five, you moved to another position, you shot the other five and the ammo was all provided. Okay. For all this. And you actually shot their PCC there. Oh, I don't okay. remember, Stage I don't remember who, yeah, who provided the PCC, but whoever won that, that particular side match, I think got to take the PCC home. The, um, uh, the, one of the prize PCCs was donated by, uh, Jake, uh, Tukasik, who's like an 18 year old shooter, I think 17 or 18 year old shooter. Nice. And so he, uh, he donated, he won it last year and decided to donate it back to raise money for mission 22. So yeah, yeah, cool that, that very cool, very cool. That says a lot about the kind of folks that come to this match. Absolutely. I mean, and, uh, and the kind of folks that are being the young shooters that are being brought up, obviously in this kind of environment, are seeing that that's important because he's been uh, up and comer for what three or four years now. Yeah, probably. 
I gotta say, like the uh, the young people that I meet in uh, in Three Gun are some of the coolest young people out there. You know, I I was uh, blown away when I first started shooting major matches, and I would talk to young people, and they'd just talk to me like I'm an adult, like they're adults, and it wasn't like a weird stare at the ground conversation like you have with other kids. You know, it just seems like there's more responsibility and more uh, maturity in in the crowd. Well, and, and, you know, they're around adults and they're interested in the same thing. I mean, I probably act more like a kid at three gun matches than an adult, but <laughs> I was going to say the, the maturity eventually goes downhill <laughs> and I'm not sure that I can, I'm not sure that I can judge who's acting like an adult, but, um, I'm not sure you should either, but, uh, anyway, <laughs> I know what you mean. They seem very, um, uh, they seem very mature. Yeah. At least most of them do. And, um, you know they have a lot. They have a lot of responsibility for what they're they're you know they're handling weapons and and I think their parents have, have uh, instilled in them a a kind of a higher level a higher um, awareness of their responsibility to act like a grown up and and so uh, but I've been mean, seeing kids like Jake and some of the other kids that come to our local matches. You know they seem they do seem very mature. Yeah. Uh, and of course they can perform. It's amazing to see the young shooters, how they have accelerated in two or three years to, to better than just about everybody that, that helped them along. <laughs> you know, yeah. But that, that uh, part is kind of crazy. Well, probably a little humbling too. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I guess so, but it's good to see because you know, if they were, if they were a bunch of little shits, it would make you feel worse, but they're not. They're really, <laughs> they're good kids. So it makes you feel, you know, it's, it's, it makes you feel good about the sport. Yeah. You want to root them on, right? <clears throat> right. You do. You want to root them on because they're good kids. So, or adults now, because I think he's 18 years old. And of course, Tim's 19 or 20 or whatever he is. But, you know, I can remember some of the shooters from years ago that were in their, their teens and, and, uh, you know, they were, it's always been the case that the kids that shot the, in the shooting sports have seemed to be, had their head on straight. Yeah. It's yeah. always seemed that way to me. Absolutely. There's probably been some exceptions, but I don't really remember them. So anyway. It seems like they don't stick around very long, the exceptions. I mean, just in general, either it's kids or grown people, they, the dickheads don't seem to stick around very long in this sport. Yeah. You know, we kind of get rid of them or weed them out somehow or another. Uh, there's been a few that have hung on, hung on, but anyway, um, <laughs> not naming any names. The, um, no nah, man, name some name. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> the, uh, the, all of the side matches also, there was a patch that was awarded that is in a crown shape and it is the rock hard, like PCC King okay. or the rifle King or the whatever shotgun king and the shotgun side match was just the he had these spinning targets and you can see them online they're an original target to this match i've never seen one like them and he made them or developed them for this match because he didn't want to have to reset shotgun targets like or he wanted to limit the amount of reset for shotgun so he made these got these targets figured out with some dude in shelbyville kentucky that it is a it's like a, a spinner, but it's not, you know, it's only got one, uh, one paddle down below and you, you have to shoot it with your shotgun and spin it around. So it has in the back of it's painted orange. So the RO has to call it is good. Okay. Nice. So this, the shotgun side match was like 10 of those as fast as you could shoot them. And then the rifle side match, which is the evening before the main match, everybody lines up, pays their money to get in. And then you have like, you, you insert a mag, you chamber around, you drop your mag and from low ready, you shoot an offhand target at like a hundred yards. Right. And everybody that, that hits it then gets to go again at like 150. And then everybody that hits that gets to go again until no, no man remains. Right. It's elimination. Right. You can buy your way back in one time at the beginning. So if you miss the hundred or whatever, you can pay again and get back in. <clears throat> so um, last year, um, Fitzpatrick won it, 
Um, and then this year, his dad, uh, Travis, won it. Oh, nice. So, yeah. So the Fitzpatricks are, I guess they just, you know, go in their backyard and shoot things off hand all day long. I don't know, <laughs> you know, but, um, but it's, it was, it's really high drama because everybody stays for it. I mean, everybody like, there's like a hundred people standing around with their rifles slung over their shoulder and everybody's been, you know, eliminated, but two guys and they're going back and forth shooting this 200 yard popper offhand. And it's, it's really pretty fun. So, and then everybody goes to the lodge, puts their guns up and, sits around the bar until two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I, I like how the, uh, um, the mat, I like the matches that can get the entire match in one place. We talked about this with the, uh, recently with generation three gun, they did a, uh, y- you know, generation three gun Their their focus is on the youth as well. So they, they have, um, youngsters that are shooting the match and they have their own division, right? Right. It's a great match. What do we call it? Junior, junior. Fly. There we go. Junior division. And so now they they take the juniors in the order that they finish. They pick two adults, and it's like a, a shoot off thing. They did this last year, and it was cool as hell to have the entire match in one place watching this uh, shoot off. So I can imagine the same type of energy at the uh, at the Rifle King shoot off. Yeah, and last year it was a junior that won it, that yeah. won the Rifle King, beat everybody. Yeah. Kind of cool. But we were just talking about that. Some of these juniors are they're. they're they're better than most of the shooters that are out there anyway. Yeah. But yeah, I heard about the shoot off, I think last year. Um, cause I, I met Brady Larkin at maybe the pro-am this last year mm-hmm. and he's a pretty impressive young fellow. He's kind of cool. Yeah. So. All right. So, uh, Brian, let's, uh, let's talk about the match flavor. This, uh, very unique match ha- obviously has its own flavor. So if you had to describe it, what would it be? Well, I would say, that if you like, um, if you like physical, a lot of movement, um, some physical challenges, and and really, this is not none of these stages were like memory stages or, you know, had a whole lot. As you moved through the stage, the targets did present themselves, and there was coaching allowed. So if you started really like you didn't grab your shotgun on your way to the next array or whatever, and you were supposed to, somebody's going to freaking yell at you and tell you. So you're not going to have that kind of disaster. Yeah. But, um, they were five minute stages and you needed the best shooters there. Um, the, it was designed for the best shooters there to finish them in about three minutes. And that's pretty much what happened. Mm -hmm. And, um, there were quite a few timeouts, but you got to do a lot of shooting in the amount of time it took. So six stages with five minute timeouts and every stage had three guns. Every stage had, uh, at least one sling, uh, gun slung at the beginning. Um, there were times that you had to re-sling your gun. There were times that you had to switch over to another gun <laughs> and sling it. <laughs> um, you did reholster your pistol, although not hot on, I want to say every stage. So, um, I, I were, like that part of it. The, uh, yeah. you know, Bruce described this when he, when he was on the podcast, uh, recently and correct me if I'm wrong on this one, but it's, it's to, uh, save clearing guns, right? So what you do is you drop your mag and then you take that last shot at a high value target and then you holster it, right? So the gun is is clear. Yes, I, I hate high-value targets because <laughs> apparently I can't hit a high-value target. I mean, I, I hit some of them, but I missed like four high-value targets. So what he does is he <laughs> – I mean, say say you – you um, your first array, you're going to have a, a – and this is like the B&B stage, stage six – you're carrying your shotgun in your weak hand. Now it doesn't have anything chambered, but it's loaded to division capacity. Your rifle is slung and then you're shooting paper targets strong hand only as you go down this, the path. Okay. So then what Bruce wants you to do is you're going to shoot your pistol again, but right now he wants you to shoot your shotgun. So what he does is he has you put your shotgun down on a table. There's a table there but there's not always a table there in his stage last year. He didn't have a table, but you, you ground your shotgun, which is still safe. 
you dump your mag and then you shoot your last round out of your pistol at a designated target before you holster it. Mm-hmm. So we know your gun's empty. Mm-hmm. And that target is generally worth like 20 second penalty. Okay. <laughs> that is a high value target. Yeah, it's a high value target. And these were um, gunfighter target pizza boxes. So they're, they're an orange circle inside a black frame. And so when you hit it, it's hinged and it falls. Okay. So, so those are kind of cool to shoot at uh, if you can hit them. But <laughs> um, if you hit the frame, it's so disappointing. But um, I'm not sure my gun even shoots right. It might not even shoot straight with a bag out out of it. I'm not sure. I'm going to have to actually check that because I miss so many of these things. But, um, <laughs> so you shoot the high value target, then you holster your pistol. Now, if you start to holster your pistol without dropping a mag, or you start to shoot at the high value without dropping the mag, the RO yet just yells at you. And the time, there's no penalty for putting your holster, your, your weapon back in the holster hot, but they're just not going to let you do it. And until you you know, they're going to make you take it back out and clear it. And, you know, you're not going to proceed. Mm-hmm, it, mm-hmm. Basically, it's time on the clock. And I don't think that that was really too big of an issue anyway for folks because of the coaching mechanism where they would say, OK, drop your mag. You know, they would remind you if you started to engage the target without dropping your mag. Right. Well, so how do you do with that? Like, I, I'm not very good at first, uh, I guess, being cognizant of what's going on around me. Um when, when I'm shooting and coaching sometimes throws me unless there's like a, a plan beforehand. And generally I, I, if I'm not expecting coaching and I get, and I get coaching, it like really screws me up. Cause I'm just waiting for that stop command. Well, and, and, and Bruce does say at the shooters meeting, if you don't want anybody to say anything to you, then you just tell them. Oh, okay. Tell the ROs at the beginning. I don't want to be told anything. Now they are going to, you know, I don't know at at a match like that after they've run 50 shooters through and they've had to tell everybody, they told everybody all day long, drop your mag high value target or whatever. They just said it routinely. If they're going to be able to, they're going to do their best to try to accommodate you. But you know, sometimes you get into kind of a rhythm ROing if you've ever ROed 200 people in three days or whatever. But yeah, uh, yeah. I've seen you with that dead stare in your eyes. Oh, it's awful. It's just terrible. (laughs) But, you know, I don't know what I've said to people. I mean, people said, did you say, and I said, dude, I don't know what I said to you up there. I mean, that was, that was 30 seconds ago. First time I shot, uh, or actually the only time I shot uh, Blue Ridge, or I shot the first three stages of Blue Ridge anyway. Um, I saw you after the match on the first night and in the parking lot and we were having a beer and you asked uh, if I was shooting it. I was like, yeah, dude, I shot your stage today. <laughs> yeah, you're just another pretty face to me. Yeah, exactly. You know, and I, by the about day three of Blue Ridge, I'm not even really, I'm really not even happy to see people. You know I mean? I'm, <laughs> I'm like, God, you're la- now I'm happy to see the last squad, but that's about it. Right. But I'm really just ready to be done because that's just a, that's a, that's a ball buster of a match to, to work. Yeah. I mean, no kidding. Ron and I, we did a, we did a Google map thing on one, one year we did a Google map thing in like three days. I think we walked like 33 miles or something. That's you know? incredible. Just running 200 and however many shooters it was we ran. And, uh, I mean, it's like one of those matches, like you buy a new pair of boots and then at the end of the five days, the boots have to be thrown away. You know, <laughs> <laughs> there's just, <laughs> Merrill, I've ruined Merrill boots in one blue Ridge match. That's incredible. You know? So factored that in. That's rarely a consumable that we think about in three gun. Uh, yeah. And anyway, so. All right, man. Let's yeah. match flavor for this is about cl- you, you climbed over car. He had four cars set up in a row and you started at one end with your rifle and you had to shoot from the top of each hood. And, you know, I've never done that before. I mean, he had some skate tape on there so that you didn't fall and kill yourself. Oh, that's nice. But, yeah. But, you know, at nine o'clock in the morning in March, there's some dew in Kentucky. <laughs> right. And, uh, and we had some interesting, you know, things happen um, there. And you shot through the vehicles with your shotgun and your pistol. And every stage was was thought out to use the props in ways that I hadn't really 
seen before and probably a lot of matches would think we're not going to do that because somebody will fall <laughs> and and Bruce said screw it I'm going to do it and I'll make it as safe as I possibly can but I want to do this I want to do it myself he sets these stages up he'll tell you these are for him he wants to shoot them right and it's it's for his enjoyment and he's just glad that everybody came out with him to to shoot and made it possible for him to have the resources to do this stuff so, um, but yeah, the, the, the props were awesome in cowboy town. If anybody knows about cowboy town, you shoot the entire cowboy town in one stage, you shoot the whole thing. It's called, the stage was called circumnavigation and it was, well, so I don't know how far you go moving 150 yards for, uh, for people that haven't been to rock castle. Why don't you uh, describe cowboy town? So it's a it's a facade for cowboy action shooting, and it has a it has a um, kind of a, a storefront walkway on one end that is probably fifty yards long, and then it has a metal building that you can move through and shoot in and out of one side, and then it has a, a facade of a bank and a couple other buildings. Probably the whole area is the size of about what I'd say a football field, something like that, with with um, buildings around uh, three sides of it, and you can shoot in any of those directions. And of course, you drive in into it from the from the other side. So, you know, you're kind of in this big U of uh, cowboy action facades, and you can shoot in any direction. And so in this particular stage, you, you used all of that. It's really not meant to be used all the time <laughs> because <laughs> there's so much space in between them. So he had stuff set up all the way around. And actually, you ran across the road at one point <clears throat> um, where, the, where the vehicles come into the cowboy town. And at that point, you weren't, your shotgun was un, unloaded and you weren't allowed to load till you got to the other side of the road. That was part of the stage description. And also, you were supposed to um, yell an obscenity, including Bruce ne- Bruce's name. It was like part of the stage description. <laughs> so you were, it was supposed to be like people would say, "Screw you, Bruce," or "You suck," or you know, um, you know, you, uh, you used to date Hillary Clinton, or you know, oh. just just terrible things. If you know Bruce's thing with Hillary Clinton, it's <laughs> huge fan, huge fan, huge Every, fan. But, <laughs> anyone that hears this, uh, go up and ask him about his. Uh, his obsession with Hillary. Yeah, he's he does still doesn't know why she's not in jail. <laughs> but um, so that that's kind of the cowboy town stage. But <clears throat> I I think I mean I think that was one of my fastest stages, and I think it was like two hundred seconds. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, all yeah. right, all right. So let's uh let's talk about the skills utilized in the match. Usually, we, well, these are things like awkward positions and heavy focus on. <laughs> you know, quad loading or offhand rifle and stuff, but this is a little unique this time. Well, um, one of the biggest things that always comes up in a match like this, and I'm kind of surprised is, um, is, uh, the slinging things. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's lots of matches that require slinging a rifle now. And uh, I think most people are fairly comfortable with that. Although it does come up as a question sometimes when people shoot blue Ridge or whatever, like, you know, what kind of sling do I need? And, And uh, what kind of sling do people recommend? But hardly anybody really ever talks about slinging shotguns. In this match, you had to have a shotgun slung a couple of times. Um, And there's really, it's really very easy. Um, uh, Most people, they freak out about it and they they don't have a clamp on their their, uh, tube extension or whatever. And they don't have a QD and all this different stuff. Okay, Brian Ray has a really interesting sling adaptation to his m1 which is he zip ties a sling to the front of it and then he uses the sling swivel in the back Mm -hmm. that's it right it's not hard shotgun's like the easiest thing to figure out a sling for i mean you don't even need to zip tie it you can just loop it over your mag tube extension and attach it to the the existing sling swivel in the back and it's the sling's generally not long enough to come off the end of the mag tube so it works that way too so that's one thing is slinging weapons and slinging both weapons 
is something that you have to be able to do. Uh, strong hand sh uh, only pistol, um, because you have to carry some other stuff with you while you're shooting. Um, yeah, awkward positions because we shot underneath things. We shot um, through cars. We shot from tops of towers. Um, I don't know. I mean, we shot from several different uh, different positions. We shot from a, a rollover prone type of position, like you know, a slot that was four inches off the ground, mm -hmm. shooting into the bays at steel. Um, we shot from the top of an A frame with your rifle, so you. You know, that wasn't that awkward a position, but it was a position that you had to get into, and it had to be a good one because you shot like 10 steel targets from there. Uh, we climbed up through the roof of a house and shot from a trap door in the top of the roof with our rifle mm -hmm. and uh, standing on a ladder. Yeah. Yeah, that was awkward, um, but it wasn't undoable. The targets weren't that far away. But just, yeah, some of those things, so being being versatile in your in your shooting positions— um, and then there's probably, it probably helped to be in, in uh, decent physical condition or at least not <laughs> terrible physical condition because yeah, at the end of four minutes, five minutes, you know, you're moving pretty much all the time. There really wasn't a whole lot of stationary plop down and shoot, you know, so you were moving a lot and, uh, over some distance. And so, yeah, there, it was not something that's for, uh, it'd be very hard if you were, you were, uh, not in some kind of physical condition. So. I got you. Um, let's see. I think we covered them all there. So this is a, um, a question that we have on all of these. What What is the uh, the terrain like? Is it base stages, natural terrain? Uh, is there a mixture, and what's the proportion? Well, we had a lot of mud, and uh, it had rained, I think, the I guess the Wednesday before. So, um, in, in that area, if you've ever been in that area, um, it stays kind of soft for, you know, days after we have a significant rain and we had quite a bit of rain actually had flooding in some parts of the state and so on, not down there, but, uh, this is open train. So this is, you know, Thunder Valley, there were three stages in Thunder Valley and Thunder Valley is like, um, three quarters of a mile long, I guess. And so we had, uh, you know, one stage and just its itself might be over, you might be shooting in a 10 acre area. Um, you know, we shot targets out to 400 yards and could have gone a lot farther than that, but we just decided that was going to be the max for this particular match. So, uh, we ran through the woods. Uh, we had to cut trails through thickets. You know, you were, you ran shooting, uh, offhand targets through a cedar thicket. And then we also had, uh, one stage in the bays, and this is not a bay match per se, but we did shoot in the bays and we used all six bays. Yeah, so. that, that I think is a unique thing. So, yeah, I mean, we, we always want to know, is it like a, uh, well, because so, God, there's a lot of thoughts going through my head. I can't get them all out at the same time. <laughs> so uh, the match that this is modeled after, which is hard as hell, is a bay match technically, right? but they use a lot of natural terrain features in that going up and over uh, bays and stuff like that. And then there are a couple stages on the end on the, each end where, uh, where you get that natural terrain in. So even though you did use the pistol bays in this match, using all six is fairly unique. So how, how was that done? Well, you start at the, it's all blocked off. The road is blocked off. Nobody can drive down that, past the bays or anything where you would normally park because you're running through that parking lot and um, you start at bay one and then you enter that bay and then as you transition from bay to bay shooting your pistol and shotgun and rifle because your rifle is slung so you don't shoot that to the very very end um, he actually has you go over the berms and you shoot from the top of the berms because in that direction there's there's nothing in that direction that you can't shoot into those berms in that direction. There's, there's no, you know, there's a good backstop there. Mm -hmm. uh, there's nothing down that road forever. So, um, you know, you go to the top of uh, one of the first berms and shot slugs out to like 75 yards. And then you went down that berm and shot your shotgun again, then you dumped your shotgun and then you ran into two different bays shooting your, um, uh, pistol and rifle. So, uh, you just, the very last bay 
is where he had an A-frame set up, so you actually ended shooting your rifle from the top of an A-frame. But I tell you, I think that might have been my fastest stage, actually. I think I shot on like 186 seconds. I was, I was whooped. I mean, and I was running as fast as I could go around and over and so forth in the berms. And, and uh, yeah, it, it might as well not be at the bays. It could really be anywhere. Mm-hmm. But it's just, that's a good spot. And he calls it the Pistol Bay Rumble. He likes that name. Yeah, PBR. The PBR. And the winner of that stage wins a six-pack of PBR. That's what he gave out last year, and he gave it out again this year. So that's what the winner gets. The the 22nd place won like a gun or something. One of the things he does at this match is the winner of each stage gets something, as does 22nd place. I like it. Goes with it's the theme of, of Mission 22. He calls you the most... What a mediocre shooter, something like that. You won the most <laughs> mediocre shooter prize. So, like at the at the match, there's a there's a winner of the of the division, and then he has twenty second place, and they they both get something. So it's kind of a different flavor because he just doesn't feel like just the winner should necessarily get anything. Right. I think twenty second place in Tac Optics was uh, Carrillo. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> Good so, job. All right, so the uh, we covered terrain, uh, farthest uh, farthest shot and number of long range shots. So you said the um, the four hundred yard was the uh, the longest flasher. Uh, what were the rest of the shots like? Most of the most of the uh, rifle is inside of two hundred, and now some of it's not real big. Um, on one stage, which is was at the barn at the tobacco barn you shot from four different positions, four different gongs out to 200 that were like 10 inch. Mm -hmm. And they, they weren't from fixed, like they were from off of this tree and laying in the prone position and on top of this mound of dirt, you know, those type of things. So, uh, even though they weren't that far, the shooting positions did make them pretty challenging. Um, the, some of the, like the Bay stage, um, there were like 10 steel targets at the very end that I don't think any of them were farther than 50 yards. And they were like maybe eight inch circles. So you shot them pretty fast. I mean, you could, you could hammer on them pretty fast, but, um, uh, you were shooting from top of an A-frame after running for three minutes. So that's kind of where the challenge comes from there. So the, the rifle shooting wasn't, tr- wasn't that challenging. The offhand rifle shooting on one stage was, was challenging for some folks, but not not undoable. And of course, you you uh, you finished shooting atop a tower out to like 400 yards. But the five there was uh, four targets, four flashers under 200, one at like three, and one at like just over four, like 402. Mm-hmm. Okay. And we had a little wind. You know, we had a we had a little wind coming down Thunder Valley. And our, our squad was all talking about, or some of our squad was talking about the 400 and the wind hold, you know. And this is a stage where you're shooting like, I don't know, you're moving 75, 80 yards through a thicket, shooting all three guns, shooting your shotgun twice, your pistol twice, four buck shot, I don't know how many rounds of shot, bird shotgun, 16 offhand rifle, and your last position with your rifle and where the stage ends is on top of this tower. And everybody's talking about the wind on this 400-yard target. And I'm like, if you get to the 400-yard target without timing out, I would call it a win. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I don't see where that's really that important. I mean, I, you're, if, you're, if that's your last target that you're shooting at and you're actually getting to shoot at it, then you probably finish in the top 30%. Nice. So, and everybody went, yeah, I mean – so the conversation about the wind on the 400 yard, I didn't even hit the 400 yard target. I think I shot at it like six or seven times, but the, um, you know, you got up there and thought, man, I got to be close to being out of time because there was a lot of people that didn't even make it to the towel, you know, didn't make it up on top of it. So anyway, but 400 and, and the 400 yard target was a flash target, MGM flasher, right. easy to call, you know, all the targets were easy to call. So there wasn't any controversy with, did I hit that type thing? Right. So there's a, uh, there's a stage gun, right? 
the 50. Mm-hmm. The 50. How far was the the 50 uh, shot? A thousand. Thousand yards on a stage yeah, gun. I mentioned a thousand. I didn't. I didn't say anything about the thousand, did I? Yeah, no. there was a thousand yard target with a strobe on it. Incredible. So, does how how did that go? I mean, I've never seen a thousand yard target in a, a match. The farthest I've shot is like six hundred forty yards or something like that. I want to say at Blue Ridge, maybe eight or nine years ago, we shot a Barrett fifty at a car, and you just had to hit the car, and it was like eight hundred yards. So this was a gong, and and it was like a like a um, Iron Maiden type target. You know, it was a little uh-huh. bigger than a regular Ipsy target, and it was a thousand yards. And they had a guy there from Barrett. You know, Barrett's out of Murfreesboro, Tennessee, which is not too far from Rockcastle. So uh, Bruce said something to Nate Noble. Said, "Boy, I'd love to shoot. You know, to start that stage off, I'd love to shoot a 50. And Nate said, "Well, we can make that happen." So Barrett brought the um, brought the 50 out and all the ammo and um you had to pay i think it was five bucks to buy your round and they donated that money money back to mission 22 anyway that's cool and um so that's how you started you started behind the glass crosshairs on the target you could even have the safety off and then um i I mean it was it was cool i would say maybe 50 percent people hit it nice because you know we had a good 15, maybe 15 mile an hour wind up there coming through Thunder Valley. And, uh, you know, even a 50 at, at, at a thousand yards, I mean, it's, it's moving it quite a bit. So yeah. most people weren't holding enough wind, but did you hit it? Nope. Um, no, I did not. It, it was a high value target. So I don't hit those. <laughs> that's right. I forgot about that. Yeah. So, so was that a 20 second penalty on that thing too then? I think it was. <laughs> so it's pretty much you, you just can't get out of this match without a penalty. Is that what I'm hearing? I got a lot of penalties. I got a lot of penalties, but a lot of people got a lot of penalties. I right. mean, it was it was a hard match to get out of without penalties. Um, well, on on this fifty shot, like I I saw the the smart people were off that platform before you could even hear the ding on the target. Oh yeah, you could be up. And standing up with your pistol in your hand before the strobe really was noticeable. Yeah. <laughs> the flight time was pretty pretty long. Yeah, so. pretty incredible. And then, yeah. uh, you know, obviously I couldn't see the strobe on the uh, video, so you're listening for the ding. Um, and then the sound traveling back, obviously that takes a long time too. Yeah, so. it, was, it, was, it, was really, it was really cool, and a lot of people hadn't shot a 50 before. And, I mean, it was brand new, you know, military green, yeah. The, the only thing that was kind of sucked about it was standing around it, you know? Oh, yeah. I felt bad for the ROs. Jared Bender, I think, was the RO on that stage. And, oh, yeah. Uh, it hurts your teeth being around that thing for more than, like, you know, one squad. He was up there all day for two days. But Jared's a mil- military guy, though, don't hasn't he? Yeah, he's probably numb to that kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, he's probably lost his hearing a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jared, if you can hear this, let me know. <laughs> All right, so the uh, uh, farthest shot, we talked about that. Um, longest slug, just over 60. Pistol shot about 35 yards, not too bad. Yeah. Uh, so how was logistics? Uh, Check-in, uh, scoring, prize table walk, et cetera. Well, um, Bruce believes in communication. And so there was a lot of communication. I mean, this this match has its own Facebook page, and he put walkthroughs for the stages on it the night before or days before as he was building them and getting them done. But, uh, as far as check-in, uh, you registered through practice score. Um, you checked into the match the night before or early the morning of, uh, plenty of time there. They had a shooter's bag and, uh, you know, some stickers and some patches and your, that type of thing. Um, Samson provided the bags, by the way. Anyway, they said Samson on them, but, um, um, as far as logistics, he put out the, the squads were listed in practice score, but they were up on the, the, uh, he printed them out and put them up on the window to the bar, <laughs> <laughs> um, the night before. And, um, you went to the, the stage assigned to your, uh, to your squad number. 
And then what he ended up doing was you kind of did the zone thing. I don't know if you've done that at Rock Castle before, but so the three stages in Thunder Valley, you shot that the first day. And then the second day you shot the ones that weren't at Thunder Valley that were on the other side of the property. So you shot four, five and six your first day, no matter where you started. So if you were six, you went to four and then five. And then the second day you shot one, two and three. And that worked great Um, as far as like parking and that kind of stuff. You know, because you had three squads there and they could all basically see each other from where they were at, you didn't have a backup. You know what I mean? You could wait for that squad to get out of your way before you went up there to park and that type of thing. I gotcha. So um, it went really well. And then the the everything finished and started on time. Weird. Uh, yeah, the, the, side, the side matches started on time. The um, prize table started on time. Um, I think I got out of there at, uh, maybe six o'clock or something like that on Sunday evening. I mean, that's not bad. No, it's not bad at all for, uh, for a big match like that where you're, I don't know, you know, almost, uh, what, 140 people. Yeah. It's pretty good. Yeah. Well, and you know, people, I like the, the prize table. It matches sometimes, a lot of times, you know, you want to get, you want to get out of there. I mean, people want to get out of it. They want, it's done, the match is over, and that type of match, everybody's exhausted. But I mean, I think Bruce did a really good job of kind of recognizing that and going, okay, we're going to get this prize table on the roll. We have to thank people. And you want to thank the people that have worked the match and have put it on and, and done so much for it and sponsored it and that type of stuff. And I think he efficiently recognized all those folks and, um, but I mean the the prize awards because there wasn't a table it was awards of folks that were based on the scores got things and then some random uh, they had a raffle too so they had to do the raffle and so forth but I wouldn't say it took more than about an hour something like that which yeah. wasn't bad no that's yeah. not bad at all all right so we we talked about pre communication um, or no uh, I skip one there uh, venue so Rock Castle. Let's uh, let's talk about Rock Castle. Um, you know, we always have repeat listeners, but sometimes we've got uh, someone who's never listened to the podcast before, may not be familiar with Rock Castle Shooting Center. Let's uh, let's talk about that for um, for a minute here. Well, I mean, Rock Castle Shooting Center is kind of near and dear to me because it's my I live an hour north of there, and it was the first place I really ever shot a three gun match, mm-hmm. and um, it is a, a few thousand acres of um, rolling Kentucky Hills down next to Mammoth Cave National Park. It actually borders Mammoth Cave National National Park. And um, I guess it's been open there as a shooting center for about 10 years now. And it has, um, you know, pistol bays. It has uh, traps, skeet, sporting clays. They now have a long-range rifle um, uh, platform set up out near the Red Barn on the way to Thunder Valley. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but they poured a, poured a concrete, you know, pad, that type of stuff to shoot long range rifle out there. Yeah. But I, um, I heard about that. I saw the, uh, the pictures of it. I haven't, I wasn't, I wasn't, I haven't been there yet since they poured that. I did the, that's where they did the rifle King thing was out there. So they oh, have okay. some steel out there and that type of stuff. If you want, cause long range has gotten to be a big deal around here too. So they do a lot of long range, like uh, PRS type stuff. And they even do a 22 PRS thing. That's um, so they alternate 22 matches and then regular PRS matches there. Cool. And it's kind of a local flavor type thing, but it's also a series. Adam, there's a guy named Adam Vaught that does them. No relation to me, as far as I know. Um, but uh, so that's kind of a regular thing um, at Rock Castle too, because there, there's parts of it that are very expansive and open. And then there's parts of it that are more wooded and just have clearings and so forth. It really kind of lends itself for a lot of variety um, in stages. Mm-hmm. So if you go to shoot at Rock Castle and you do a three gun there, you're not going to uh, – <laughs> you might shoot one or two stages in like a, a gravel bay. But the majority of what you shoot is probably going to be – I mean, at the pro am last year, we shot one stage on a golf course. I mean, it's on yeah one, one of the 
we shot from the the tees. You know, a, it's yeah. It, so it's incredible. They have a golf course there too, by the way. But yeah, it's uh, it's incredible when you when you hear, but because I've heard so many great stories about Rock Castle Shooting Center, uh, especially you know, as um, I you know, I've been there. I think like four, no, five or six times, and then you know, associating with you and uh, Brian Ray. Um, get to hear all, all kinds of great stories of stuff that's happened in the past. But uh, one of the things I've always heard about is shooting on the golf course. And, you know, I couldn't really picture in my head how that would be done. And then we did oh, it. Oh, one year, it, Pan we did Am it the shotgun, they had the USPSA Pan Am shotgun there. Yeah. I don't remember how many years ago. So they took a bulldozer and around the perimeter of the back nine of the golf course, past where the pro shop is they cleared bays into the woods and there i don't know how many they set up i think it was like 30 stages total for that whole match but so they had like a dozen stages because you know uspsa shotgun not all of them are very long so you don't need a big area but they just do need to be spread out enough so people drove around the perimeter of the back nine shooting into the woods which has a ridge behind it so you're basically shooting into the hill, a hillside and that was kind of where the majority of the stages or where a lot of the stages were it was really neat so you know they're they're willing to do that kind of stuff um really brian and i put on local matches there and you know they're as long as it's safe you're shooting in a safe direction you're shooting onto their property there's some a lot of the places you're kind of in a bolt Mm-hmm. And you're in a hole that's like 1,600 yards long. So you have a lot of, you know, you have a lot of options with that property. Yeah, there's several safe directions. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we shoot, our team event, we shoot from a moving golf cart. Right. And um, a lot of people are like, well, how do you do that safely? Well, if you head down this gravel road, there is nothing. Like if you shoot in that direction, you know, you could shoot out of the front of the golf cart all the way to the back of the golf cart as long as you're not shooting back at the start position, there's virtually nothing that you can hit in that direction that's, you know, that's people. You know, unless you put it out over the berm, which there's no no way to do anything about that. But, you know, we're shooting basically at our targets, which are downhill. And if you see videos of the of the team event, it's, it's, it's just very few places you can do that where you can drive a golf cart for 200 yards shooting out of it and uh, have a backdrop and a backstop that just goes the whole way with them, you know? So yeah, Rock Castle also has a lodge. It has a restaurant. And in the last five or six years, they've been able to serve alcohol. So, yeah. Um, the party does, there's always been that there as far as brought in, (laughs) but (laughs) there's always been some parties at the rock. Um, the first pro-am it was, was classic. But, um, the, uh, you know, there's a whole lot of socialization that goes on there. You know, you don't just go back to your hotel room and crash, although you're welcome to do that. But, uh, you know, I, I think two o'clock in the morning, you could have gone down to the lobby and there'd still been people down there Yeah, during this match. So. Yeah. And, uh, several other matches too. <laughs> it's pretty yeah, incredible. I mean, it's pretty regular. Yeah. It's pretty regular. Yeah, and I would think that that when you hold a match at Rock Castle, that adds like a you know a flavor to it of its own. Uh, just just being at, at Rock Castle in that environment. Yeah, and we I mean we had a guy from um, the UK there. Uh, the guys, you know, you don't get to see these folks all the time, so right. it's kind of nice to not just shoot with them. You know, you don't have to worry about getting your social time in while you're all out the range, although that's, that's part of it too, but you're going to have some time to hang out, catch up, have a few beers, get something to eat. Um, all the meals were provided during this match for all the shooters. Nice. So you ate breakfast in the morning on a buffet. They brought you your lunch in a box lunch during the day. And then, um, they had a buffet both, both nights and it was phenomenal. It was really good. Nice. So, and the booze was for you. You had that was not included. So got to buy your own booze. You got to buy your own booze, but that's that's a small price to pay. <laughs> Plus the money stays there. You know it goes back to Rock yeah. Castle. And you know I've I've heard uh, Bruce Davidson speak uh, several times about that specific uh, um, concept. Is you know have your meals and your your drinks at uh, at Rock Castle. So the uh, 
uh, so we can continue having matches like this in the future, you know, so the business succeeds, which is a great concept, right? Makes a ton of sense. But um, but Bruce like designed this match around it, right? So your meals are included. So now now that's uh, part of your match fee. Uh, he puts the like you said the um, the shooters or the matrix in in the bar. So he wants you there. Like Bruce is a smart guy. Yeah, and a part of it's twofold because it helps him keep people on schedule. You know, I mean, if you got to be at breakfast that's free at six thirty, <laughs> you'll probably be there, and then you'll be at the shooter meeting at seven or you know whatever. And then if he brings you your lunch, you know, and says, here's your box lunch, now get to the next stage. <laughs> you know, people generally know that there's limited amount of time. He's trying to get finished. He really makes a point about, about staying on schedule and about how he gives a little spiel about how, you know, if everybody here takes 30 more seconds to get ready than they need to, then it's, we're all going to finish two hours behind tonight. Right. And so people really take that to heart. And when you show up to one of his stages and he what he he made a point this partic- this year and this was part of the part of the match kind of the rule set I guess you would say or the logistics of it was um the ROs will call for the squad and but they're really only waiting for the first three shooters. And when the first three shooters are there, they do the walkthrough. They start the walkthrough right then when the first three are there, the first three in order to shoot that stage. Mm-hmm. If you're not there, then you're going to have to catch up and get somebody to tell you what's going on. So when they call walkthrough, you're supposed to walk down, but they're not going to hold for the last person to get there. If they're at their car or they're getting their water or you know whatever they're doing, going to the bathroom they're only really interested in the first three shooters because that took a lot of time, you know, and you've been to matches where you're like, okay, walk through. And it's like 15 minutes Mm -hmm. that somebody's not there. Right. So they're really only wanting the first three. And and Bruce tells everybody that. And he's like, so if you want to get the RO version of the, of the (laughs) walkthrough, you need to be there when they call you. Uh, but, it really wasn't an issue. I, I didn't see it as an issue, and I don't think anybody else. There was no complaints about because you were told at the at the get go, and most of the people that came to this match were were pretty compliant with with being on time and being at the right place. And and you really you really didn't feel pushed. Well, Bruce demands like a level of personal responsibility from his shooters too. You know, it's it's not like he's he doesn't allow um, a shooter to be a prima donna. Right. Well, and you don't feel like that at, the, at this match. It really is a it really is a feeling like you're all in this together because the, ma- the stages are so freaking hard and long. <laughs> yeah. That, you know, you're really paying attention. I mean, you know, there's some matches where people wander off, you know, because they know how they're going to do it. and They don't care what you do. Right. This isn't really one of those. You know, you're really wanting you're watching to see how slick those cars are, whether it's the best shooter or the worst shooter. If he's going in front of you, you're, you're paying attention. So there's a lot to pay attention to here. And, uh, so it, it is kind of a, it's kind of a collective squad type thing and there's coaching. So, you know, one of the videos and you might've, you may have been talking about this earlier, alluding to this earlier was somebody throwing shotgun shells into somebody's shotgun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what I was talking about. But you know, that's, how much is that helping that guy? Well, it's helping him, but I mean, the, the, you know, basically the, the stage wasn't going very well. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, but that's just kind of a cool factor. And here you got Trant who's, you know, really, uh, the, one of the best shooters out there, very highly competitive shooter. And he's paying attention to everybody in his squad to see if they need help. Mm-hmm. And that's just kind of the, that's kind of part of the flavor of this match. It's nobody, nobody goes to their truck and reloads mags when somebody's shooting necessarily because they're trying to pay attention to whether or not they need anything. And I mean, I think Brian Ray ran two guns out to people. Um, I think one was on a squad that wasn't even ours. So this we is a, a this is a replacement uh, yeah. gun match. Yeah. It's like shotguns down. We need a shotgun. And it's like, you know, he's hoofing it. He's quick. He's a quick little sucker, but you know, he's, <laughs> He's hoofing a shotgun out to him. Well, he's so low to the ground. 
Yeah, he moves fast. It's amazing. Like little, little, he's got them little hobbit feet that just scoot. But anyway, um, yeah. But so that type of thing is it's everybody's involved when somebody's shooting. It's really kind of fun, um, and that's kind of you've been hard as hell, and it's like that as hard as hell too. You know, right. everybody is everybody is watching somebody, and if somebody needs some help, then it's funny how everybody jumps into like. Um, you know, it's like a Chinese fire drill type of thing, trying to find a shotgun that's like either unloaded or, you know, whatever they can take out to them. Yeah, Vortex shooter source is like that too. Yeah, yes, yeah, I shot that last year. I shot that last year with you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's what I'm saying. Like that's two matches, yeah. Yeah, so well, I, rem- well, I rem- remember uh, Brian um, getting ready to shoot, and he's like, who's got a Glock? And I was like, I got a Glock. He's like, put it on that table. I'm like, okay. <laughs> and I didn't know why at the time, but it was – in case his goes down, then you run that up to him. Well, and and I went back to shooting a Glock right before Hard as Hell because I was shooting a, a 320, and I wanted to shoot the same pistol that he did because we're flying out there, and then if something happens, you know, I'll be shooting the same pistol, have the same holster. I mean, I know it's not a big deal, but I don't really shoot one pistol better than the other. I don't shoot e- any either pistol very well. That's kind of <laughs> the way it is. But... um. Tom Young was one of the the match uh, range masters at the Rock Hard match, and so those guys shot through. Him and Dave Merriman shot all those stages in one day for their hard ass, but they shot through. So they're working the match. So Tom Young's shotgun goes down right at the very end of one of the stages down at Cowboy Town. Of course, you started your 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 um, the stage with a shotgun full of slugs. It had nine slugs in it to begin with. So Brian, Tom calls for a shotgun because his shotgun screwed up. Well, a shell came apart in there or something. And he's yelling, I need a shotgun, you know. And Brian runs and brings him one up. And he hands it to him. He goes, this shotgun's empty, damn it, you know. And afterwards, he goes, you handed me an empty shotgun. And Brian goes, well, it would have been full of slugs. And he goes, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think of that because this portion, the last portion of it was all bird. Right, I mean, right. It was fine clay, so I mean, it'd been kind of hard to shoot those with a slug, but um, <laughs> so he goes, "Oh, yeah, it was, wasn't it?" You know, well, thanks. You know, anyway, but those are the kind of things that that uh, I think the coaching and the bringing guns. You know, the the stage was he's run out of time. I think he might have actually timed out before he got to the end of it just because his shotgun, you know, shit on him. But uh, and it was his ammo, it wasn't a shotgun. But um, you know, it doesn't really help that shooter at that point that much you know um and you just you know you want i think it's more fun and the match has got a, diff- a better flavor to it if you can do those kind of things it's probably not for every match mm-hmm. you know, it's not for every match but for matches where you have five minutes to shoot them and it takes most people at uh, five minutes i think it's kind of cool yeah. yeah yeah there's um there's definitely like uh good arguments both ways but uh yeah, again, when when five minutes and a lot of people are timing out, what what what's it going to hurt? You know. Well, in Bruce's description of helping, is that it? Well, his um, requirement is that it has to be organic, quote unquote. It can't be planned. Oh. Now, I don't know, if you know that for sure, but I don't think any. <laughs> Based on how people were scrambling around, yelling, and so forth, I'm pretty sure it didn't happen inorganically <laughs> um, on any of the times that I saw it. But, you know, like if somebody needs a, a Glock mag, you can't just have one in your back pocket waiting to hand it to them. Right. You know what I mean? I it, has to, it has to be. And for most of your best shooters, they're not really having those kind of issues. But, um, but gear, like you don't want somebody to rifle to puke on them and they're going to completely time out right at that position with you know a bunch of other stuff to shoot when you can get them another rifle and and they can finish the stage well maybe some people do feel like you they should just you know eat it but this particular match is not like that so yeah i i can see how you could game that um i would imagine having four preloaded shotguns (laughs) would be one way to do it (laughs) and uh yeah, you might want to get one of those, uh, you know, jerk awards for that one. But all right, so let's uh, let's move on to pre pre communication. You said that uh, Bruce likes to keep everyone aware of everything. There were several Facebook posts, and 
I even got a uh, a an email on this one. Bruce included me on it, so he could so um you know I could see what the uh, the match flavor was like. But yeah, there there's a uh, uh, seems like he uh I I don't want to say uh, over communicated, but there were very little questions going in. It looks like. Yeah, I mean, I think you almost have to. Uh, at this one, like the, the round count was, uh, I want to say it was like 172 a rifle and like 150 bird and I don't know, 160, 70 pistol. See, that's a little misleading. <laughs> right. So, so, you know, it's more like 400 rifle, you know, because these aren't, um, these aren't give me shots and you're not shooting a lot of paper. And so, um, you know, I think he had to put a lot of that stuff out there ahead of time. Now, if you shot it last year, you realize this, but if you didn't shoot it last year, you know, he didn't want people coming with, you know, expecting 172 rounds of rifle, bringing 200 with them because that's not going to do it. So, um, he did a really good job with that. And then he did a good job recognizing sponsors and he did a good job recognizing the charity. I think, you know, I think he did all of that really well. And then uh, you knew where to be and and to be ready. Um, so I think I think as far as communication, he did a great job. Most of the stuff on the Facebook page was good, but also he sent out multiple emails to the uh, shooters through Practice Score mm-hmm. to give updates within the two or three days and up to the day before the match started. I personally like the emails through Practice Score um, because uh, Facebook for me has it's uh, there's too much shit on Facebook and. Uh, Facebook now does not show you the things you're interested in. Like their algorithms all jacked up. First of all, they, they hold down the, the reach of gun pages and now they're holding down pages of, uh, or hold, holding down the reach of pages in general. So the odds that I'm going to see something from a page that I'm subscribed to are very, very low, but an email right. comes directly to my email, my inbox and it's on my computer. I check my email twice a day. That, that I think is the proper way to do it. And even if you, you know, put videos and pictures and stuff on Facebook, reference it in the email. I think that's the right way to do it. Well, and also you can, you know, if you it's like, when am I supposed to be at that shooters meeting again? You just, you don't have to go searching for it. Yeah. There. Yeah. You know? If you've ever tried to find a post <laughs> again that you saw one time, yes. it's like nearly impossible. Well, and people take them down and stuff too. Yeah. You know, they realize they effed up and shouldn't never put that up there but it was entertaining and I wanted to find it again. It bothers me. I can't find it, but, <laughs> but, um, yeah, I, I agree with you about Facebook. I have a big problem with Facebook. Cause I mean, I, I, that's kind of how I put stuff out there related to shooting and that type of stuff. And it's kind of how our local folks really look at stuff. And then also it's how a lot of those, uh, match videos and those type of things are recognized. You know, it's kind of like what, folks expect to see after a match is yeah. the Facebook videos, you yeah. know? And so, you know, as somebody that like doing the team event, we want some of that, you know, we want some exposure. We want golf cart videos, you know, that's what we want. We want a lot of them. I want to, for four days afterwards. And Bruce mentioned this after his match, he's like, any videos you guys post on Facebook, make sure you tag me because I get to relive the match for like another 10 days. Yeah. <laughs> And, that type of and that's what I think is the is the right way to use Facebook as like an entertainment tool, right? To to show this community and have fun. But passing along information, especially important information that you're going to be responsible for later, like a round count or when to be at a stage, I think that's email. Oh, I think you're right. Yeah, I think absolutely you're right. At least to the shooters. Yeah. You know, for your signed up shooters, if some somebody is just curious and on facebook goes hey you know what's the round count to this and you know you're not even in the match oh Why yeah are you asking? this match is closed <laughs> i mean are you just curious you know anyway so yeah i agree i think and practice score is a good uh mechanism for that because yeah. if you're registered then they have your email and then we send out updates tell you what, what man i i used practice score for the first time on the um the md side when I did uh, this this uh, intro class that I taught, and it is freaking useful to communicate with your people, and you can load all kinds of stuff in a practice score to where people would never have to ask a question or anything. Um, right. But that email everyone has signed up is a very useful uh, function of practice score. Well, and if you're not using practice score now, and there are some matches that still don't, 
But if you're not, I mean, people kind of really expect it. And actually people make this, I think some people make decisions about when they, when you say scoring, you know, the question about how is this match going to be scored used to be, is it points? Is it time-based or whatever? But now some people are asking about, you know, how is this going to be out there? How am I, who's, how are you doing scoring? Are you using practice? Score? Yeah. Yes, we are. And people are like, oh, good. Because everybody seems to like it. I mean, there's no naysayers it's, when it comes to practice score. It's difficult to cheat in practice score, you know? And is it? I've not tried that. <laughs> I, trust me, I've tried. No, I'm just kidding. Have you? Okay. But, but um, well, here's here's uh, where I was going with that. I shot a match last year where um, you um, got your time written down on the stage by the RO plus your penalties, and uh, then they gave that sheet to you, and there was only that one sheet. And you, yeah. as the shooter, were responsible for putting that in the ammo can. And then that ammo can was then emptied by the stats guy and put into a spreadsheet. And I don't know about you, Brian, but I've... That's not exactly high reliability, is it? <laughs> <laughs> well, and so I asked the question, uh, you know, what if you guys make a mistake? And he's like, we don't make mistakes. Sure. I was like, okay, buddy. <laughs> and I, I worked in aerospace. Uh, and we used Excel for like a ton of stuff and math problems were, were huge in, in practice or excuse me, in, uh, Excel. So when you find like a, a math problem from some guy who's calculating like stress for something that's supposed to be holding up a spacecraft, you're telling me there's nothing in your, in your score sheet, in your scoring Excel, there's no, pr- there's no chance that there's a, a math problem in there. Okay, I'll, I'll guess I'll trust you. Well, in 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 the in the history of three gun and USPSA and shotgun matches and everything, there's been some pretty epic screw ups related to scoring. Yeah, and there's been some six hour waits for scoring, and there's been some people miss their flights <laughs> waiting yeah. for that type of stuff. And then there's been, I mean, I can tell you, there's been some people that won matches that didn't win them that had to give their stuff back, and um, and we're glad to do it because they didn't win. You know, I mean, there's the, most people are fairly gracious when they mm-hmm. find out what there was a scoring error. Uh, I didn't win. OK, I'm going to give this back to so and so, you know. But see, that's not that's that's happened several times. It doesn't happen often, but it's happened enough that that uh, you just I've not seen it that I know of. And maybe other people have have um, examples of it, but I've not really seen it in any matches scored by practice score. Yeah. And I think because it takes, you know, the scoring is done right at that time and reviewed right at that time. The coolest I ever saw, I've not seen this since, and maybe you have because you get around that area of the country, but uh, I shot a shotgun match in Georgia several years ago. And once that, they had Wi-Fi there on the range. Mm-hmm. And once you had reviewed your score right then, on the iPad or whatever it was we were scoring with, I assume iPads. Um, I went back, would be put my gun in my bag, and I would get a email from Practice Score on my phone in my pocket. Oh uh, yeah, tell me that that was my time on that. I mean, I got immediate score email. Yeah, uh, that's the only match I've ever had that did that because they had Wi-Fi there. I'm assuming and had it set up to do that, but it was really neat. You know, you know, um, maybe that was like a test or something like that because that, that doesn't even happen at SUPS right now. But in chatting with uh, Ken on the podcast, um, I don't want to say it was last year at Hard as Hell. No, no, no it was 2016 at Hard as Hell, and uh, he said that uh, they are looking. They are their intent is to do that through a practice score app that you have on your phone. So instead of sending you an email, it just goes and it's a notification on your phone. And uh, same thing, like it reports your scores real time like that. Like that's their ultimate goal. That's where they're they're driving to. Obviously, there's probably, you know, low, low hang, or not low hanging fruit, but more important things to to do other than that. But um, but yeah, that's that's one of the features that they're going to be adding down the road. And yeah, if you're not on practice score, there you have no excuse. It's free. iPads are cheap. Nooks are cheap. Yeah, nooks are what thirty nine bucks, forty nine bucks, something like that. Yeah, I mean they're not, and uh, I do still see people taking pictures of oh, yeah. the squad times and scores and so forth. And I, I absolutely uh, do I don't that really too. See it come up as being arbitrated. I mean, do you? I don't. So see I, I, 
I wrong. always take a picture, or someone on my squad does, but I, um, I do that for, um, for like insurance, and I've never had to use it. Right. Yeah. In fact, last year at the uh, Colorado Three Gun Championship, uh, there was someone who made an error on one of the uh, iPads and wiped out my uh, squad's entire scores. And I can't remember if it was on one stage or all stages, but we were on the RO squad. And uh, uh, one of the dudes that was running stats was able to go through all the practice score history data, whatever, because it logs everything, right? And he was able to recover all our stage times, and they had gotten wiped out. So it wasn't even a total loss, even though it appeared to be a total loss. Oh. (laughs) Well, you know, when they used to do paper and give you the little, you know, carbon copy or whatever, Mm -hmm. uh, Brian and I, we used to just put Brian on there. And then we would always just um, we would just turn in the best time. <laughs> on that. And then, um, you know, I don't know how many matches uh, he finished in the top five because half of his scores were mine. But it was significant number. Um, but that was early on. And, you know, we stopped doing that years ago. And, yes, practice score has made it harder to do things like yeah. that. Yeah. Well, I was well, I was saying about that match that I shot is uh, I could have just followed uh, Tim Yackley around all day long, uh, why? Because they they didn't even have like a RO initial or the the paper <laughs> and they didn't keep and the ROs didn't keep a copy, so I could have just followed Tim Yackley around, listened to what his time was, subtracted one, and then put my shit in the ammo can and never shot the match and and won it. Right, and at ninety nine point nine percent of Tim Yackley or of uh, Dave Hartman is Tim Yackley. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Which eeks him out. Everyone would totally believe that. <laughs> yeah. Hey, maybe maybe I uh, maybe I should uh, just delete that part and we uh we never had this conversation. And I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll go You might want to save that. You might want to save that for later in case you end up at that match again. Yeah. <laughs> and they still have the ammo cans. I don't think I'm welcome back. <laughs> I don't think That's... I'm welcome back to that match. Well, that would just be a way to prove your point. And to actually Absolutely. get that guy that said he didn't make mistakes, it'd just be a way to, you know, stick it to him. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. All right, Brian. So we uh we talked about uh pre communication. How was the uh the staff at the match? Oh, they're just great. Uh they were tired from shooting the hard ass division the night before, where they shot all six stages in in one day and ended up shooting at night, basically under uh, the headlights of trucks. But, uh, other than that, um, they were, they're mostly, mostly local guys. Uh, but, uh, some guys from out of state, some guys from, from out West and some guys from up in Pennsylvania. Uh, we had both, um, the owners of, uh, innovative steel targets and gunfighter targets there. And both of them were on the stages with their targets or with, with some of their targets. And we're working those stages. So uh, they not only gave back by, by by having targets there for us to use, but also worked the match. Very and, cool. Uh, yeah, th- that's pretty cool. And um, so we had um, a lot of local guys that, that were able to come out Friday and shoot the hard-ass division and then worked the next two days. And uh, they really did some – they really did some huffing, but, uh, and they were really big on, you know, the on deck shooter being there and, and being ready to go and that kind of stuff. But not, you know, you never felt like you were pushed. They were polite. These are just, these are Kentucky boys that they were happy to be there, um, and happy to see everybody from out of state. And I don't know, it was just kind of cool. Um, you know, a lot of them are out of, uh, shoot at that local range and or shoot out of bluegrass sportsman league in Lexington. So all of them are experienced three gunners. You know, there was nobody there that had that just, this is their first time ROing or being in a big match like that. So, um, they did a really good job of keeping everybody safe. A uh, really good job of, uh, um, making sure everything was reset. I mean, I don't think on my squad shooting these big, huge stages, I can't think of maybe one target that I can remember where it wasn't reset for somebody. So they did a good job going behind everybody and making sure that everything was right. Because there was, you know, one stage had several activating things that you had to pull. Uh, One was called Yank the Monkey. 
and he had a monkey <laughs> hanging from a cord, like a stuffed monkey, obviously. Right. But you yanked the, that stage <laughs> well, he... was named Yank the Monkey, and and um, you yanked this monkey, and it activated some stuff. So all that stuff had to be reset, and at least one RO, their whole job was just to make sure that not only that things were scored, but everything was reset, and we just didn't have much of an issue with with reset. So it's pretty cool. I like how you had to specify that the monkey was stuffed. Yeah, well, you never know. Well, well, we Bruce, don't have native monkeys around here that I know of. I've never seen one. I've spent a good deal of time in the woods of Kentucky as a as a boy. I grew up here. Never seen a monkey. But um, anyway, uh, but Bruce's Yank the Monkey, I think that was just a – who knows how he came up with that. He, he does run who a knows? pet shop. Yeah. Yeah, he runs a pet shop. I don't think he has monkeys, but anyway. But he knows a guy. But he knows a guy. He can get you a monkey. If yeah. you need a monkey, he can he can supply a monkey. If you want a live monkey, that's extra. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to it's it's hard to remember. I don't know how he runs a a, a pet shop. I just don't see Bruce run a pet shop. I, but you know, um, I don't either. I I really don't. Like he doesn't seem like the pet shop kind of guy to me. But uh, you know, talking to him. I've had I I got the opportunity to hang out with him quite a bit when we were doing the uh um the evaluation thing for uh Industry Choice Awards last year and talking to him about like his general uh philosophies and stuff like that uh it seems like he's a manager you know and yeah and like a people organizer and when you listen to how he runs this match and how he runs his uh his big event with his toy airplanes like yeah. that, that really shines through right so maybe it doesn't matter the commodity it only matters the uh uh that he's you know managing people maybe that's yeah, that's can, his strong suit right and people that can do that just you know some people say is leadership learned or is it is it something that you just have and uh i don't think he learned it I think, he is yeah. but have you seen the match shirt for this match? Uh, I saw, I have last year's, but I haven't seen this one yet. Okay. So this, this year's is Bruce. He's on the front of the shirt. It's nice. his face with his hands out, his fists facing you. And it says on his knuckles, it's written rock hard on his knuckles. <laughs> and he has these dark sunglasses on. It's a black shirt as all match shirts tend to be for whatever reason. And he's got the, his fist out. It's very scary looking. And I mean, it just, it just would scare small children and animals away. <laughs> but, um, I said, how am I supposed to wear that shirt? <laughs> yeah, exactly. What do, you mean? what do you mean? You don't like it? I'm like, I, I guess I like it fine, but it, it is, it is a, it is an intimidating freaking looking shirt. Absolutely. It doesn't look like a pet shop owner on the front of the shirt. If you told somebody Hey, who's that on your shirt? And you say, oh, it's this guy that owns a pet shop. They wouldn't believe it. <laughs> no, not at all. They would think it was uh, the dead pet shop like you were talking about. Well, and I tell people it matches that I'm a nurse, and they can't believe that. They go, you're a nurse? I'm like, yeah. Why? Is there something wrong with that? You know? <laughs> yeah, I, I know. Like, I, I cracked up uh, the first time you told me, and then the second time you told me, I was like, oh, he must be serious. Yeah. I mean, next time you, you bust your head open like DJ Petro did one night, you know, and then you give me guff about being a male nurse. I won't put, uh, I won't uh, dress it for you, <laughs> <laughs> like I did. <laughs> well, I, uh, I guess I've never actually seen you in action uh, either. So, well, I mean, I do administrative work now, so I mean, you really don't want me taking care of you, right? Um, I but might, if, there, if there's I paperwork injury. to be done, yeah, there's. If there's paperwork or joint commission shows up, I'm your man. But, uh, <laughs> but people, you know. P- there's a couple. I had two other male nurses on my squad this year too. So they oh, were cool. like, and I didn't realize that's what they did for a living either. And I think maybe Blout is a nurse. I think he is. I think he's a he's a nurse in the army. So, you know, look out. I guess I don't know. But nice. I'm sure I'm the senior one. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's uh, let's talk about the fun factor. We uh, this is the subjective part. So this is the vot factor in this uh, in this match. What'd you think? Well, for me, this type of 
for me, what, what I look at for whether I'm going to go to a match or not is the stages is just the stages. I don't ever really, you know, I don't do great at matches all the time and I, I do fairly well in irons, but you know, I don't ever expect to, to, to walk the prize table at the beginning of it. So I'm really looking, is it worth my, my, um, my time to travel to this match? Now this one was basically local, but matches like this, hard as hell, Blue Ridge, the old task force dagger match down at AIM and so forth. Those are the kind of match really get me going where you look at a stage and you just wonder if you're even going to be able to do it, you know? So it's not just about shooting because most of us get to a point where the shooting is, is, um, you know, it's instinctive, you know, Mm -hmm. we don't really think about it very much. So you have to throw in these other things and it just adds the interest. I like the physical challenges. I like the different shooting positions. And this, this match just had, had all of it. It had a lot of shooting, a lot of shooting on the clock. Um, a lot of running it out of different positions and in and out of vehicles and up ladders and that type of stuff. And, and so for me, this is the best kind of match. Um, and then I like, like we talked about before, I like the, um, the kind of the squad involvement with the coaching and, the the ability to, to help if you really, something really goes bad or whatever. And then I like it being only two days. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cause the three day ones, if, you know, a three day match like this would be something else. It would be extremely taxing. And, uh, the third day would be rough on everybody, but, uh, I like that it's two days. And I, I really think that the, the participation factor for a two day match, uh, is something that appeals to people because, you know, taking off, if you're, if you shoot a lot of three gun in this area, taking off in the middle of the week and that type of stuff, you can't do that. Right. Uh, 10 times a year. So that's kind of cool. Yeah. I, I'm, a, I'm a fan of the two day matches too. Um, I do like to sprinkle a couple three day matches in there throughout the year too. But if, if I pick, uh, and you know, I guess I'm like a, a special case, but if I and now that I'm actually like planning to go travel two matches and then come home like normal people, <laughs> mm-hmm. instead of just like staying on the road, then uh, yeah, two day matches are seeming more appealing. But that said, like for a good three day match, I will make the time. Right. If it's three days, I mean, you know, hard as hell is definitely worth flying out to Vegas for and driving up, even getting a rental car. And I mean, that for me is a five day trip because I yeah. fly the day after. But I think that's really, really worth it. Um, you know, and there's people that came a long way to shoot this thing. And I think, uh, we were shooting, there's a guy named Ty, I can't remember his last name, young fella, hadn't shot a whole lot of three gun that we met out at hard as hell. And, um, I want to say he was from Colorado maybe, but anyway, he came out to hard, he came out to rock hard. Uh, fin- <laughs> so, Finner, right? Yeah, man. I, I think that was him. Yeah. And, I, sh- uh, I shot with him two years ago at the, uh, uh, Colorado three gun championship. Cool kid. Well, and he's shooting hard as hell. He was like, this is awesome. And we're like, well, there's one kind of like this back in Kentucky in March. And he was like, I'm signing up for it. Nice. And we were like, we'll see you there. And I was like, sure, whatever. Yeah, he was there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's so, he's and, not a talker. He's a he's a doer. Yeah, you know, a good shooter. I don't know. I mean, him, for as much as he re- shot, he shot, he shot really well. Yeah. So. I don't know him really well, but uh, from – from the time that I've spent with him, he, I, I like him as a, as a person. He's a good kid. All right. So, uh, Brian next, uh, next up here is a new one that we added. And this, this is kind of funny, uh, based on this match. Um, this is what we call the match fee quotient. And we're also calling this the Bruce just colloquially because Bruce Davidson actually put this one out there on the podcast and suggested, uh, that we added to the the match recon. All the people that uh, support the show on Patreon agreed that this is a, a good piece of data, and we threw it in there. So this is the fee of the match, which is two hundred dollars divided by the number of stages, which is six, and uh, that equals thirty three bucks. So at thirty three dollars per stage, Brian, how many of these stages would you shoot again? Um, I would pay two hundred dollars shoot the whole match again. Really, um, every yeah. stage. Let me think. Let me think. Yeah, I mean, you almost have to see that as kind of a bargain 
<laughs> because, um, you know, we were talking about this earlier is, is, um, I don't remember who did the math. I think it might've been Mark Tukasik did the math, but you know, Tim Yackley who won tack optics shot for this match. It took him like 17 minutes on the clock to mm-hmm. shoot six stages. Mm-hmm. And he won hard, like hard as hell last year. And he shot 17 minutes for 10 stages. So the amount of value for the rounds that you're going to put down range, as well as the time on the clock, it'd be pretty hard to beat. And really I don't, um, yeah, I mean, I think, I don't know that I want to do it the next weekend or start the next day, but you give me like two weeks to rest and I would probably (laughs) shoot that whole match again. Um, because there's just, you're not going to, the problem, this is the problem that Brian and I had driving back from Rock Castle last year after Bruce's first rock hard is we're driving back and we're like, what are we going to shoot for the next 10 months that's anything near as good as that? You know, we just finished it and we were like, that was really awesome. And I would say this year was better than last year. So, um, yeah, I mean, I would, I would definitely shoot those again. Um, but even if, even if you didn't want to shoot them again, you'd have to say that the value for the $200 match fee with your meals paid for. And I mean, I imagine that that eats up almost all of that match fee per shooter with only 130 some odd shooters. And some of them were probably comped that were ROs and that type of stuff. You know, there were, um, I imagine most of that money went back into the match. Yeah. Yeah. So, so probably pretty good value. The problem would be, how are you going to, how are you going to scratch that itch after you've done that? Yeah. Yeah. It's like, uh, now you got to do more, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, where do you go? I mean, I've got rock castle an hour from me, but I feel bad for some of those people. <laughs> you know, where are you going to go to climb over four cars and shoot off the hood of each one of them with your rifle? Yeah. Who's going to let you do that? You know, remind me to tell you a good, uh, allegory after, after the podcast about this one, I can't say. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> well, Where else is a good idea. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, uh, funny things that happen at the match. All right. Well, I had to jog my memory here cause it's not as good as it used to be, but, um, there were lots of good fall videos. Um, uh, and <laughs> people fell, people fell a lot last year. There was a really good pick last year of some guys, um, shell caddies smashed into the ground that were it was like a quad loading something other tacom thing that had just shattered all over the place with all the shotgun shells laying in the mix um but there was a lot of good falls on the the cars and then just basically the open terrain going through the thickets and those type of things uh that was that was those were pretty cool um lots of running guns out to people whose guns had crapped on them and the pandemonium that goes along with that, which is also funny because yeah. seeing somebody in, um, I don't know, suffer or whatever. We all kind of think it's funny afterwards. I don't know why. Yeah. But, uh, there, it's, uh, it's really fun to watch people suffer when there's like, you know, no consequences other than a score, you know? Well, and when you just shot the stage and did pretty well, and then somebody else is having to yell for a gun, it's just kind of amusing. I don't know why, <laughs> but uh, but but that was fun, and that adds a little something to it. And then I'm um, I'm pretty sure, and most of our squad would attest to this, that one of our shooters shot a uh, clay out of the air with a slug. Really? Yeah. Um, what had happened was the the loadout was was specified for your shotgun. So you started in a box saluting the flag because there was a flagpole there and everything. And you flipped a tire and then you ran up and you grabbed your shotgun off the table. And the loadout was uh, two bird, uh, two slug, two buck, and a bird. Seven rounds in the gun. So you made the you, the gun was was chamber empty. You racked in a bird. You shot a um, a knockover bird target with your bird shot, 
And then you shot two poppers that activated flippers with buck. And then you shot two slug gongs while your flippers were tossing your bird into the air. And then you shot your last two bird at those as they fell. Okay. So this happened very quickly. So okay, it, it was uh, buck, buck, slug, slug, bird, bird. Well, this is the way it, it, it kind of went like a bird, buck, buck, slug, slug, bird, bird. Like oh, okay. That. I got you. <laughs> That's I got you. how fast you had to do it. <laughs> so um, the guy, one of the guys on our, on our squad, Andy, he had a jam and he had to rack a round out and he shot – the buck and then the bird got in the air and then he shot a slug and then he shot a bird and then he, sh- anyway, we're pretty sure after watching <laughs> this, that he shot one of the birds out of the air with a slug. So because he still had his two birds in his gun when he got done, because he kind of got out of sequence there and you were shooting down Thunder Valley, like all of Thunder Valley right. was in that direction. So you're talking about, I don't know what a uh, mile in that direction with nothing. So it was fine. But, um, that was pretty cool. I mean, I don't think you could do that again, but so what is the run out of a slug? I mean, this thing was falling too. It wasn't like it was at its apex or okay. It's falling out of the air. So he got the hit. I mean, it's not a penalty. You can't really (laughs) prove that he did it. So, (laughs) well, that's pretty cool. And not too bad with the, uh, uh, what's it called with the run out of, of, uh, Thunder Valley there. Well, and Bruce, Bruce really put a lot of thought into how he was going to have every, he wanted to force people to shoot two slug targets before they engaged these clays that were already in there. And, uh, we had one guy in our squad that, that, uh, got all, got the whole thing. And then I got, I lo- I missed one bird and I think pretty much everybody else on our squad missed at least one bird. But uh, anyway, it was so, it was interesting. Then you shot your shotgun for like thirty more rounds or something at bird bird target. But, right. Well, so it sounds like a uh, a difficult engagement. Oh yeah, it was. <laughs> well, and that's one of those things you show up when we were talking about this earlier. The fun fact you show up and you just look and say, "I wonder if I can do that." I guess we'll find out in a minute because you you don't know if you're going to be able to do it or not do it. I've right. never tried that before. There's no. I don't practice that. Don't know anybody that does practice that. And one of the things it really tests is your gun's reliability with three different loads. Yeah. Um, so you're going to shoot a two buck, two slug, and um, three bird all in one loadout. You know, you better hope everything works like it. You don't even have time to, you know, bump your, your, um, your bolt or anything if it hangs up because those birds are going to be on the ground by then. Huh. It's kind of neat. Yeah, sounds like sounds like a fun little uh, little array. I mean, the the smart play was just to make sure you got the slug targets, and then le- if you don't get the birds, no big deal. But make sure you get the slug, get the hits on the slug target. Nice. All right, so uh, you got one more one more note of a, a funny thing that happened at the uh, the match here. Well, all the meals were provided, so a lot of people were eating at the uh, at the lodge, and then the. The uh, second night was like Italian night, and they had um, really good chicken, um, Alfredo, and uh, spaghetti, and that kind of stuff, and garlic bread. I love that kind of thing. Plus, you're starving at this point anyway. (laughs) And um, they had these decorative bottles on the tables with, I guess they were supposed to have flowers in them. You know, they're like wine bottles. Yeah. And apparently the sand in them looked enough like uh, pepper. That at least two people, Bruce being one of them, who'd been there all week, <laughs> um, seasoned their, their Alfredo or whatever. Michael Boone was the other. One. Oh, nice! <laughs> with their uh, with, with their with their sand. Nice. And nice. so they couldn't figure out what was the matter with the sauce at first and that type of stuff. But anyway, I found that was a. You know, it's kind of like one of those you had to be there thing, but to <laughs> to see Michael Boone try to get sand out of his mouth uh, that he just ingested with his spaghetti sauce is kind of funny. And if you know Michael Boone, yeah, the basic thing the guy does is funny. Um, yeah, he's a riot. Right. So yeah. anyway, that's another that's another thing that happened. But there was a whole lot of 
of goofing off and a whole lot of after the match was the shooting was done the last round was fired all the guns were put up there was a whole lot of uh uh hanging out in the uh in the bar and and you know having a few beers and or maybe the few, um, a few more than a few uh, <laughs> but that's part of it yeah you know absolutely. it reminds me of being back at the old you know it reminded it took me back a few years because some matches, it seems like everybody just scatters, you know, because they want to do well tomorrow. You know, I got to go get in bed. I want to eat something because I got I shot four good stages today and I want to do good tomorrow. And then this crew was like, those three stages I shot today were really <laughs> hard and they sucked and I'm really sore. So I'm going to drink eight beers and go to bed at, or, you know, maybe I'm going to drink half a case of beer and go to bed at three o'clock in the morning. You know, that just a different way of looking at how you're going to prepare for the next day. And it's kind of more of that crew was at this one. So, but some people <laughs> did leave, but I'd say the majority of the people, if you'd have gone down into the bar at two o'clock in the morning on Saturday night, I would say 50 people probably would still been down there. So, ah, uh, man, that's a lot. Yep. Yeah. It was pretty loose. Good. I liked it. It was fun. Good. So it sounds like you really enjoyed the match. Yeah, and and the thing is, is um, you know Bruce uh, Bruce makes a big deal. The Mission Twenty Two guys were there. There were some guys that are sponsored shooters by Mission Twenty Two, and um, some of them are are ex active duty, and some of them are current active duty. And they're a great group of guys. I mean, they're just hilarious to be around. And and um, they sold shirts there, and they worked the stages. Some of them worked the stages with the uh, with the other um, ROs, so they participated. And I want to say last year, Bruce raised like a couple, maybe $3,000 for the match. And this year, or for the Mission 22. And this year he raised, uh, I think his official number was $11,805. That's incredible. Now, this is 137 people. Yeah. And the only funding that he, you know, the, the money that he got was from the side matches, whatever he had left of his match entry fee. I think he donates his, I think at one point there was a match director fee that he was going to get paid or something for putting this match on at Rock Castle. I think he donates that back into the, <laughs> to that. He basically gives everything that, that this match takes in to Mission 22. Yeah. And that's, so that's a yeah, huge cool. thing for a, a small organization like that too. Oh yeah. And I mean, they were just, we didn't know the official number when everybody left. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of people that did not go home with any folding money from that match because they they just gave it over. And mm -hmm. a lot of them, a lot of them know they have no there's no way they're going to win the shotgun side match, but shot it 10 times anyway and paid ten dollars every time. they. I mean, they basically Bruce tells you your match fees paid for you, um, your meals are all provided so I don't expect you to go home with any cash. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. You know, I need you to give it to me. Give it, give it up. It's not required, but give it up. And I mean, that's really kind of the spirit of things. And so people do. I mean, you know, there's people that, that put $50 in the can to shoot the shotgun side match one time. They have no chance of winning, no chance of winning the thing. No, but, that's, that's cool. I love the, I love the culture too. The, uh, the giving culture that he's brought to it. Yeah. And then that makes you feel good too. If you don't do as well at the match, at least you participate in a charitable event. Yeah. So, no kidding. Yeah. Well, Brian, it sounds, uh, sounds like a great match, dude. Like a ton of fun, a ton of shooting on the clock and, uh, you get like, you know, five whole minutes to, to shoot it. If you, if you suck, <laughs> which is, uh, which is a good thing for guys like me. Well, you know, if next year, if folks out there want to shoot this match, he's going to open it up again next year. I think he's going to do it about the same time next year in, in early March. Mm -hmm. And if you're looking to knock the cobwebs off you don't and you don't feel like practicing, this is a good one to take care of that for you because it will do it. Because I didn't practice at all for this, and it was it was the first two stages were rough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but now, now you've got a lot of – thousands of rounds under, under the belt from, from all that shooting. Oh, I, yeah, I made up for it in like the first day. No problem. <laughs> well, right on, man. Well, I, I appreciate you uh, taking the time to 
put together the uh, the match recon for for this uh, uh, this match and for taking the time to come on the excuse me on the podcast and uh, and tell me about it. Well, thanks for thanks for hearing about it, and uh, and I think that uh, uh, Bruce is uh, you know if it if he escalates this any more next year mm-hmm. than he did for the first second year, I don't know that I'll be alive to do another podcast. <laughs> Well, I tell you what, uh, one of the things uh, I would suggest to Bruce is uh, let's combine these two events that he uh, that he runs. You know, he's got this toy airplane event. He's got this shooting event. Let's combine the two. Let's uh, let's see if we can um, have like a battle royale um, amongst the uh, the shooters and the the pilots. Got to shoot those <laughs> things down, baby. <laughs> well, I wouldn't give him any ideas. Oh, it's out there. It's it's out there. Great. <laughs> well, and this match is part of a of a I guess a series now. Yeah. Which is hard as hell. You know, Sky was there, Brian Nelson was there. So there's a Texas one, a Utah one, a Kentucky one, and there's a trophy that uh Jason from Innovative Targets made that's like this huge seventy pound piece of iron that is actually got a clay holder in the top of it, and we shot that a, every shooter shot a clay out of that clay holder at that match on, on the, one of the stages on the stage. Yeah. yeah. On the stage. And it has cut out of Texas, Utah and Kentucky as part of the trophy. You got to look at it. It's online. It's, it's, and it's there, crazy. I don't know how you're going to fly out to Utah with that. Yeah. Oh, that, that's one thing I was going to say is, it, weren't you saying that thing weighs like 70 pounds or something? It's 70 pounds. It's like, I don't know, four foot tall. You know, Whoever made that target, Bruce, was not really uh, thinking this one through because shipping on that is going to be an mf or and you're not going to be able to fly with it. Like, you're only going to be able to drive with that thing to the, to the next match. I think he's driving to Texas, and then maybe he'll leave it there, and Sky will drive up to Utah with it. Ah, I mean, there you go. I guess that logi- there's logistics. We didn't cover that logistics. Trophy transportation should have been up <laughs> yeah, there. Exactly. Well, so... Uh, we should uh, we should mention so Sky Killian, uh, match director of the three gun at ETTS shooting range, and I believe that's just north of Dallas. I believe. Yeah, uh, and there's still there's still slots available for that. I yeah, think. so they're going to be doing a um, a hard as hell Texas, and uh, in conjunction with uh, the Rock Hard and Hard as Hell, that's uh, the traditional one in Utah, which is kind of a cool thing to be able to have like this series um there is going to be a series winner from my understanding and uh and all that thing but i guess you got to get you got to be one of the 137 people that shot the rock hard to be uh this the series winner but well yeah, pretty cool assuming, thing. yeah so. what was that brian i said i'm assuming that you do and and i know one guy that's probably going to shoot all three so yeah <laughs> uh tim yackley yeah probably <laughs> Yeah, uh, Brian Nelson probably shoot all three of those too. So, those are a uh, couple of uh, contenders there. Yeah, but the one in Texas you ought to look into. That's that's fairly close to you. It's uh, I think it's September, and then of course Hard as Hell's in December. Yeah, Hard as Hell's a great one to finish the year with. Yeah, I, I mean it's just a blast. You know, I shot uh, Red October Kalashnikov Festival Championship. That's what it's called. Oh, I'd love to do that, dude. That was a kick in the pants, and it was very hard as hell like, and um. You know they they obviously use the uh, the same facilities, same uh, stage designers and stuff. That was a kick in the pants, and I got to shoot someone else's rifle, which was fun. I got to shoot Tim Yackley's uh, ammo, which was even funner. And um, so yeah, that was that was a ton of fun. But then after that, I was like, well, you know, I made my my um, my TPC my subs trip for the year, so I don't want to go out west. And uh, watching the videos uh, that you and and Brian Ray and and uh, Josh Tarrant and all, all our other shooting friends put up about or uh, of the uh, hard as hell match. It's like, well, I definitely made a mistake. I should have went out and shot that. <laughs> well, you know, years ago I shot the first, the second Task Force Dagger match mm-hmm. down in Blakely, Georgia, and Brian didn't go. And I shot that. I mean, you know, you talk about a bay stage, and this th- if your bays are two hundred yards deep, and there's th- it's not really a bay match, you know. <laughs> right. So. so I'm leaving that and I'm calling Brian. He's like, so how was it? I'm like, I'd love to tell you that it sucked, but it was awesome. You know? <laughs> and he's like, shit, you know? So the next year we both went to it. That was the year of the monsoon that was 
my, the most epic match I ever shot was the match of the monsoon at Taste Test Worth Dagger. So, but anyway, yeah, those type of things, you know, you have to pay attention and know what's what's out there and what's good and and where they're doing new things and that type of stuff. And of course, Hard as Hell is not new, but this one that's on, this is on its second year, and it looks like that this trend is going to continue. That this is going to be one of those that if you like this type of thing then it might be a must do. You yeah, know? absolutely. Yeah. If this is your thing, this kind of crazy shit is your thing. Then this one is very likely a must do for you. You know, don't be left out. <laughs> <laughs> well, right on. Well, well, Vot, thank you very much for, uh, for being a part of this, man. I always appreciate, uh, when you're on the show, it's always a great time. And, uh, thanks for the, uh, the two hours you gave me here. It was it two hours. Yeah. No. I'll never get that back. <laughs> <laughs> and for uh, for all the patrons listening, we appreciate you. We appreciate uh, your contribution to the show. We're sitting in an office. I'm sitting in an office here that is uh, paid for by you and your contributions, and it's always appreciated and never goes unnoticed. So thank you for being a part of the show. And if you're not a patron, sign up at patreon.com slash three gun show. That's P A T R E O N. And uh, Brian. Shoot straight, man. I'll see you on the range. All right. Thanks, Dave. Hey, before you take off, if you're into this type of content, check out patreon.com slash three gun show. That's P A T R E O N. There you will find bonus podcasts, all kinds of other different benefits of being a supporter of the three gun show. And you can support yourself for as little as $5 per month. That's patreon.com slash three gun show quick reminder that if you enjoyed this episode of the podcast subscribe in itunes google play podcast addict or wherever you get your podcast content so you will always get the very latest thank you so much for downloading listening and subscribing to the show i'm dave hartman and i'll see you on the range if you are finished unload show clear